We're going to start off this morning uh, dealing with S34, which is a repeat of a bill that came out of our committee last year, trying to establish a second housing bond and also doing other miscellaneous things. And then after 45 minutes or so, we're going to move into a housing roundtable discussion for like an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I'm aware of the uphill battle on a second housing bond and uh, this was put in before the governor's speech yesterday where his, he alluded to the fact that he had talked about the success of the first bond and then he said, but instead of doing bonding, let's just pay for it, some of it now uh, by putting 20 more million dollars into VHCV. Uh, uh, one of the things I want to accomplish is to understand uh, how he makes that equation. Uh, obviously, that's very welcome news and is a great down payment, but I don't think it's anywhere near what a bond would produce if we had the wherewithal to produce a bond. So I'm going to ask people like uh, Mora and others to, to give us some ideas as to if there, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's, a, as I say, it's an uphill thing, but I just want to keep our thinking caps on when we get an offer potentially of that kind of significant money, how we can leverage even more money or parlay that into more housing. So um, let's start off with Becky, if you could just uh, walk us through, and because of the framing I'm putting on this, we can do it fairly briefly. Let's not get caught up in the weeds here, but just the general approach that was being put forth in this bill, which I think uh, several members of this committee co-sponsored with me. And I thank you for that. Sure. Um, oh, I see. I am a co-host now. Okay. I will bring it up on my screen. Okay. And it's, it's on our website, right? So we can all just pull it up. It is. And do you also see it on the screen now? Yeah, it's okay. just tiny. Could you just make it? Yeah, uh, just a little bit yeah, bigger, Becky. Sure. Thanks. Um, okay. I think if I... Is that okay or is that too big? Is that... It's good. That works? That's, okay. go that's better. Okay, great. So uh, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, this is S34, which is... Um, an act relating to funding affordable housing. As the chair just mentioned, this is um, essentially rerunning a bill from last year to create a second housing bond um, that would be issued by VHFA and uh, to be used by the uh, VHCB to support more affordable housing. Um, I'll highlight some changes just from last year as I go along, but the first section of this bill um, is the sort of intent, uh, findings, intent, and purpose. Um, so in the findings, there is, there is language, which was similar to last year, that um, there was this housing for all revenue bond that was issued in 2017 uh, to support the development of affordable housing throughout the state. Um, and the, what's updated is at the top of page two is um, the, what, what that bond um, generated. So the results of that bond are uh, generating a total of 37 million in bond proceeds that VHCB uh, used to fund the creation and improvement of 843 homes across the state, leveraging 200 million in other resources. So I think just compared to last year, the, the funding was able to be used um, over the past year in, in addition to what was reported last year. Um, Subdivision three talks about um, the a continuing need for housing, particularly um, a housing shortage in light of COVID-19. There's a, an increase in the incidence of homelessness, um, as well as the difficulty in finding a home even for individuals and families with financial support for rent. Um, and subdivision four, four finds that additional investments are needed to create these uh, affordable housing options for Vermonters. Um, and it has the same uh, goal stated as last year to reverse demographic trends, contributing to a more inclusive and equ equitable state and supporting growth based on 
existing infrastructure and settlement patterns. Um, the purpose of the bill is uh, to develop and improve affordable housing for uh, current and future state residents. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, the intent, intent in subdivision two at the top of page three is to authorize VHFA to issue a new bond. And this can be a single bond or a series of bonds uh, between um, FY23 and FY28, and then transfer those proceeds to VHCB to support this development of, a, of additional affordable housing. Um, section uh, the next few sections are, are sort of the substance of creating the authority um, for both VHCB to use this funding and for VHFA to issue the bonds. So section two is relating to VHCB's, um, it's creating a new section to allow them to use the bonds for this uh, second, this, the second bond um, to fund housing that uh, meets community needs. Um, and there's, uh, there's some language in there about funding the creation and improvement of owner occupied and rental housing for Vermonters with very low to middle income up to 120% of the area median in areas targeted for growth and reinvestment. Um, and there's some priorities set forth um, in this section, which are to create a new, new multifamily and single family homes, address blighted properties and other existing housing stock that require reinvestment. And this includes mobile home parks. And then finally at the top of page four, the, the last priority is to provide service supported housing in coordination with AHS. And this includes those who are elderly, homeless in recovery experiencing severe mental illness or leaving incarceration. Um, section three is, a, uh, is in statute and it's the VHCB annual report uh, requirement. So this section is um, just saying that in addition to the reporting that VHCB has to do um, on lines 12 through 14, it says, um, in addition to that, that report has to include um, the list of projects funded from this second bond. Um, section, and I'll just pause if anyone has any questions. Nope, I don't see any. <laughs> uh, section four is um, the section of law that deals with the property transfer tax. So this bond, um, the idea is that it would be supported by property transfer tax revenues. Um, the section of law sets out how those uh, property transfer tax rev revenues are distributed. Um, and just, I'm just scrolling down here. Um, for some context, um, there, there's already in statute um, ways that this uh, tax revenue should be used. Um, it is, I think as you all know, it's not followed every year, but um, there is 50% uh, that, that should go to VH, the Vermont Housing Cons Conservation Trust Fund, 17% um, to the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund, and 33% to the General Fund. And then um, before all that happens, 2% goes to the Department of Taxes for Property Valuation and Review, uh, a special fund. So what happened with the first housing bond, um, as you'll see on lines sort of 12 through 19, is that language was added here that says, before you distribute any of those uh, property tax re transfer tax revenues as set out in statute, 2.5 million will go to pay for the, um, the principal and interest of that, that first housing for all revenue bond. Um, so what this bill is doing is um, moving to page six. It's saying sort of in addition to that, before you distribute all those other ways that the statute sets out for, for the property trans transfer tax revenue. And in addition to that 2.5 million that's going to the first bond, we're, this is setting aside um, 4 million of that revenue received to be transferred to VHFA to pay the principal of an interest due on those bonds, on this second bond. Are there any questions on that? Is that number just higher because the bond proceeds are $50 million now or the interest rates have changed or what? Um, I just used the number from 
last year's bill. I think it was because it was a higher bond amount, but yeah. um, so I don't, I don't know um, if this still sort of corresponds this year to what, what is the correct amount, um, but this was what was put in place in, in last year's bill. Okay. Um, and then subsection F here is, uh, is saying that while both bonds are outstanding, um, the, the rate of tax on the pop property transfer tax ha can't be reduced below a certain amount that produces um, $30 million in subdivision one in the instance when both bonds are outstanding and at least 18 million when the second bond is outstanding. And I believe the first bond is set to um, end in 2039 and this bond would be um, 2043. I would, can we pause there and have some questions? So how much, how much do we usually get annually in revenue from the property transfer tax? Um, that's a great question. I have to check with the joint fiscal office and it, right. I think it changes every year and, and I don't know what, Je what that Jen, 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 Jen Hall, no. Paula could probably answer that. Yeah. Jen will know. Good morning, everyone. Jen Holler with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So it's been running about 38 to 45 million over the last couple of years. Um, that's the entire amount to the state. And of course it goes to different purposes. Um, as a result of the recent um, surge in home sales and prices, um, the forecast is now that FY21 will be up to about 54 million, and the forecast for FY22 is 68 million. Wow. Thanks. That's, That's right. But was I reading it incorrect? These are one time amounts in that section of the bill, or they're annual amounts? Because it's such a volatile tax that I just feel like it's committing a lot of money that we may not have if it's annual, but I'm confused. Yeah, that, that, is, um, that is annual. So that's saying you, so that, that is sort of suggesting that you have to have the tax rate at, you can set the tax rate at an amount that will produce at least that amount every year for the next 20 years while these bonds are outstanding. So the general thinking here that I, I certainly subscribe to is that in the last bond, we were giving, um, we're taking away from VHCB, Jen, you could correct me, I can't remember if it was a million and a half a year of their annual appropriation to help pay for the debt service of this $37 million bond over 20 years. So instead of giving, I'm, I'm simplifying this greatly, but instead of giving VHCB an extra million and a half each year to produce a million and a half worth of housing, they were getting 37 million right up front and can produce a multitude of housing now and, um, and, and lose that uh, one and a half million every year for 20 years where they would be hopefully building housing over the 20 years, but it would coming out much, much slower. In addition, that 37 million wound up to produce 250 million of construction of housing in the first couple of years of the bond. So in my mind, it's sort of like if we were developing a, a, a community, a, a part of Burlington, we we're building like a hundred houses, you know, and we had a certain amount of money, we can only build a fraction of those houses right now if we had to pay 100% of the cost of the housing immediately. But everybody takes out mortgages and they only pay 5% now. So you build 20 times as many houses right now as opposed to um, waiting uh, uh, by spending the money. So we're basically trying to leverage funds. And the problem we faced is Rating agencies say there's too much borrowing in the state of Vermont. So this idea, while creative, uh, potentially makes Vermont a higher, a higher risk in terms of defaulting. Um, so 
what I would hope to do, and I wouldn't at this point, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this bill, but I'd like to hear from Jen and Mora, unless people have further questions or Becky has more to say. Uh, from Jen and Mora, just briefly, the success of the last bond, some some metrics, and um, is there other ideas out there now that we, I mean, the $20 million extra that's going to VHCB is not a done deal. We haven't gotten into all the needs and how that money is going to be used, but it's a huge amount of money that I'm very happy to see. But how can we leverage that into more money uh, so we can build more housing now uh, and not necessarily wait uh, for it to trickle out uh, over the years ahead? And, and Michael, may I just Add, add to that, I guess one question is, Becky, are, are you done? Did, was there anything else you wanted to highlight? Before? I, I think that the rest of the language is just um, the sort of statutory authority relating to VHFA being able to issue the bonds. Um, I think I would just highlight um, just for the, just to go through it quickly is that um, Section seven is saying in this fiscal year, at least 4 million would be set aside for this purpose um, from the, the, those revenues. And then section eight of the bill repeals all of these authorities in 2043 when the bond matures. So um, that's, that's the quick summary and I can stop the share now. Great, thanks. Thank you, Becky. Thanks. Okay, uh, so let's move and, on. And Michael, my question for you was, you know, when and it was exciting to hear about the 20 million, there's no question, but you know, gosh, that's day one of, of this process. And, and there's gonna be a lot of vying for that one-time money. And we, it's a top priority of ours, but there's a lot of other one-time money priorities, whether we end up at 20 million, I think we, as you wisely, I think say, we, we it's great, but let's keep moving in. I mean, I think we should keep all the burners going because who knows where we'll end up with, with that proposal. Correct. And if we can get some multiplier effect, maybe we can kill two birds with one stone or solve some yes. of the other one-time needs and not uh, in any way reduce the amount of housing projected to be built with that $20 million. So, yeah. Senator Brock, you're muted. Randy, we can't hear you. Can you just refresh our memory, Becky, uh, on the definition of affordable housing? Uh, I believe the one that I see is in the chapter uh, in, 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 in Title 32 regarding tax credit, charitable investments and in housing, uh, but there may be other definitions somewhere. This one essentially says that VHCB shall adopt a rule uh, in which the definition and it meets certain tests, but is there any other definition of affordable housing in statute? I, I think there is, I, I would have to find it. And I guess I would also point to the fact that this bill specifically says that the creation of funding is um, for owner occupied and rental housing for Vermont, Vermonters with very low to middle income up to 100% of the area median in areas targeted for growth and investment. But I can, there's another statutory section and I can, um, unless maybe more or Jen know that offhand, I can find it for you quickly. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm Senator Brock, I'm sure Maura can, or Jen can tell us the, at least for the purpose of introduction of this bill, we were trying to replicate the standards of who this housing would be built for that was in the first bond and they could tell us what the criteria was. Okay, so let's move on to uh, more. Mr. Would you, I yes, have, I'm sorry, Senator yeah, Rahm, I did see you. I think you. my hand's like going yep. yep. background. Um, but when Jen and Mora are um, sharing, I, I just love to hear sort of a philosophical thinking around the mix and I know with the rental assistance, it mostly probably has to go to rental housing, but the sort of mix of homeownership and rental housing that we're thinking about, because 
it just feels really disproportionate. We know it is disproportionate in the state who stays in a cycle of rental housing, you know, and who faces barriers to accessing homeownership. And I just want to see more focus on homeownership. You want to see more focus on home ownership rather than rental? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, just, just as you know, we we've discussed uh, you know we've discussed that at length, and and uh, we're also wanting to focus on in the the asset gap too at a later point. But uh, we you know we push home ownership in this state big time, and you know there is definitely been more uh, there is a there is a major need for rental housing too, and it's not just you know for all people. I mean there is so. Um, and, and home ownership obviously represents a huge asset for many. Um, I, I think as we look at, the, at that, those questions, I'd also love to look at our home ownership mix of our income brackets because to, I think Randy's getting at this. We need more housing in all areas and the cost of housing is such a barrier to any housing being built. And, and I would love to see us also from sort of expand the range of what we're looking at. And as Jen and Maura start their testimony, I'd love to hear sort of also what some of the lessons learned are from the last bond and how we uh, can improve uh, in, improve this work as we go forward. Because, you know, we it was great, but it wasn't, you know, there's always things to improve. Okay. So Maura, would you mind starting out and... Uh, just give a brief history of of your feelings about the last bond and what it accomplished, and then go into the the I guess the larger question of you, if you see anything in your world that we should explore, given this uh, fact that I think we're going to have significant monies to put towards housing. Uh, Certainly would be wonderful if just the twenty million dollars survived for VHCB, yeah. but it would be nice to see if we can even do better somehow in producing housing stock. Can do that, and that can be quite brief um, to leave time for Jen because I think a lot of your questions are really on what VHCB accomplished with the last bond. So my name is Maura Collins. I'm the director of Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, VHFA's role in the last housing bond was to issue the bond because that is what we do uh, and then turn the proceeds over to VHCB who um, then deployed it, which is why I'd like to leave, I hope it's okay with Jen, but the majority of the time to Jen because a lot of the discussion you're talking about was on the outcomes of the last bond because it sounds like you want to replicate um, some of the great work in the future. Um, to speak to a couple of the questions that I've heard so far, um, Senator Sorok, and the numbers that you were um, talking with Becky about of the $4 million of PTT and such uh, are based on the fact that it's now um, a $50 million bond. Uh, so we will need to um, double check with our um, industry partners about if those numbers need tweaking um, since last year's bill was introduced. But I will tell you that in the two years between last year and when the bond was, um, the first bond was done, those ratios did not change. And therefore, since it's based on a ratio of the size of the bond, I wouldn't expect those numbers to change dramatically. Um, so uh, Senator Rahm, you were asking about the volatility of the property transfer tax. And I can tell you that in the first five years of the tax, it was between 12 and $15 million a year. But then since 1998, 50, when it was 15 million a year, that has been the floor. It has always been far above that. Um, it grew to a previous peak in 2005 of $45 million. But as Jen um, mentioned, it's projected to be far higher now. The chart I'm looking at is um, a year too old, so it doesn't have the current numbers in it. Um, and even during the financial crisis, the very low point was just shy of $25 million. So in all the years going back to 93, 
just um, the July collections of the property transfer tax have covered the debt service for the last bond for the last 20 years. So actually looking at a chart that goes back to 93, for the last 20 years, just what the state has received in July has covered that two and a half million dollars. So um, there is, it is a volatile source as we're seeing that there's an uptick in it now. And yet the um, $12 million floor to it does seem, I can tell you that the, um, our underwriters and rating agencies and investors all feel like that is a very comfortable floor that folks aren't worried they're going to, um, that we have a risk of dropping below. Um, as for defining affordable housing, it is in several places in statute. Becky will probably find it in the Act 250 statute where uh, priority housing projects are defined. VHCB and VHFA both have statutes where we um, work with primarily our mission service for low and moderate income folks. Um, Jen can talk about the specific income targeting that the last bond had that was unique to this bond because this bond was trying to do something of reaching not just the historically um, low income affordable housing that Vermont has served, <clears throat> but was trying to really include home ownership, as you mentioned, Senator Rahm, and trying to reach into, some might say, the missing middle of um, the kind of workforce development housing that uh, isn't traditionally eligible for government subsidy, but this bond could support that kind of housing. Um, right. I will let Jen talk about the um, homeownership projects that were supported by the bond. I can say that VHFA as a homeownership lender would support um, a, a mix as we had last time of rental and homeownership options. I think there are a lot of opportunities as we try to um, reach underserved populations who have not been able to um, achieve homeownership through market forces that a uh, government supported initiative like this could really um, allow for some specialized targeting and marketing and working with partners to deploy um, this money in a in a special way. Um, and I will say that um, there is nothing I see from the investor bonding um, side of the equation that should prevent the state from considering doing a bond. This is still a viable option. Interest rates are still low. Interest rates are actually projected to remain low. My belief based on the economists I listen to is that interest rates will remain low for probably the next two years. So um, you could take your time a bit with this and we could um, try to hit the market as best as possible. That said, we spoke about the treasurer's concerns about the idea of borrowing versus appropriations. Those are other issues. I'm just here to deliver the news that the markets are still, you know, working well. And I would, um, and I would expect that um, VHFA could achieve a really good rate, the same strong rating that was achieved last time on the bond, if you structured the bond in a similar way as last time, which is what S34. Uh, proposes is to keep that same kind of structure. And some of those things that um, help the rating are things like um, having it be the first, however much a PTT revenue that goes to support the bond. Investors don't like being last paid, they want to be first paid. So that's why I'm saying, you know, starting in the fiscal year, those investors were paid with just the July revenues, you know, and so they, they like being first. They also like knowing that um, the legislature is committed to keep the property transfer tax revenue at a certain level so that they don't have to worry about if they will get paid and they want you to um, keep that. But as I mentioned with the history that we have of the PTT, um, right now that seems very feasible to everyone looking at, which is why we achieved a high rating. I'm happy to answer technical questions about the financing or turn it over to Jen to talk about the much more exciting work, which is um, the question of, you know, what's the good that came out of this investment? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Maura. Any questions for Maura? Um, so just before we get into Jen's testimony, uh, it's been very helpful. Uh, I guess part of the reason for introducing this bill is, um, uh, is 
if there's a significant amount of money being made available for housing, as I've said before, I want to think outside the box as to how we might uh, creatively use that money to produce the most housing possible. And I, I strongly support the work of VHCB, and I think they do a remarkable job in leveraging what money we give them to produce a lot of housing. And in full disclosure, my firm represented the Vermont Housing Conservation Coalition for decades, and I was in the room with Governor Dean when the group there decided to uh, use the property transfer tax as a funding source for VHCB. So I'm tied to this, but at the same time, with that kind of money on the table, is there, are there more creative ideas than just giving all the money to VHCB and let them figure it out? There very well may not be, but I think this committee should have its antenna up to see if we can find some other idea, uh, other tweaks to, ma to maximize. You know, I fully believe in the bonding function, but unfortunately we have uh, other pressures there, but maybe there are some other ideas. And, um, and having said that, I know VHCB supports that kind of thinking as well, the leadership at VHCB. So um, Jen, with that, Introduction, uh, welcome, good to see you. Can you, the floor is yours. There's a lot to talk about there. Thank you for the opportunity. And let, um, let me begin by um, saying, of course, we're delighted um, that um, the governor recognizes the need for more housing. Um, I think that the work that your committee has done and even the introduction of this bill and the ongoing conversation around the potential of a bond has set the stage for agreement um, um, around housing being a priority uh, and that it being an appropriate place for one-time investments. And so I think maybe that's helped um, put us where we are um, today. Um, the first bond was, um, we think, and I um, believe it's been your impression too, uh, a big success. Um, um, you might be delighted to know I don't have an actual presentation for you, so no lots of pictures. I've showed them the results. Um, you've been very gracious about letting us come in and share those results with you in the past, but 843 homes over um, 23 different communities in 11 counties around the state. Um, and uh, the construction on some of those is finishing up now. Um, it was paused and delayed a little bit when um, there were construction shutdowns early on in the um, earlier this year related to to COVID, um, but construction has picked back up and is now underway. Um, and so those are happening around the state. Uh, so much that I'd like to share with you. Um, so this news is very um, fresh to us. In fact, um, Gus Selig, our executive director, is just sharing it with our board right now. Um, we only began to um, understand that there might be a proposal um, in the governor's budget um, over the last few days and have seen nothing in writing. So we are very much still absorbing it. And I cannot speak to you today about exactly what we would propose to do it and what proportion of different types of housing um, would, would be the best. Um, I think that the priorities that you just looked at in S34 are really appropriate priorities. Um, as we think about what could be done with that 20 million, we might add um, creating more um, uh, BIPOC access to, to, to homes um, and thinking about how we create um, housing options in communities of opportunity a little bit more. And then also um, there, there are 2000 people in motels right now due to the pandemic and um, that uh, it feels like that's got to continue to be a, a focus for all of us to create permanent homes and help folks transition out of those situations. Um, they are safely sheltered, but they are not in sustainable, um, viable situations. It, it's something um, we all need to try to address together. Um, Senator, Senator Rahm? Yeah, I mean, speaking of all of those particular populations, I just worry that saying we should prioritize them doesn't 
really get us there. It, it doesn't have accountability measures that say we're going to tie ourselves to increasing BIPOC home ownership in the state and closing the gap. So I just wonder how you all feel about kind of real metrics that move the needle on some of these things rather than just sort of it would be nice to have. I really want to get more scientific with equity in the legislature. It's very like we're just going to sprinkle it in. Um, but I think we need real numbers. So I just want to say that. Well, I have to confess, one of the reasons I love working in, is in housing because it's easy to count. You've got you've got an apartment, you've got a home, and you know who lives in it. So those are things that we can report to you. And when things are embedded in legislation as a priority, that's what we do. And then um, we are accountable to you because we need to come before you every single year and report to you what we've done with those dollars you've decided to entrust to us. So I absolutely appreciate um, appreciate that concern. Um, later on today, and um, over time, um, particularly in the area, I think affordable housing is um, one of the areas of state investment that has done nowhere near well enough, but pretty well in terms of um, creating more opportunity for people who may have um, uh, been disadvantaged in the past. And later on this morning, I think in your round table is Michael Monte from the Champlain Housing Trust, and he um, they're very attentive and have good data and met, um, around who is living in their housing and, and he might be able to share with you um, um, what the demographics are there. Uh, uh, so that's that's one quick possibility for continuing the conversation about that. I wanted to, um, so the chairman mentioned leverage and, um, and also that the 37 million um, a housing revenue bond did leverage about 200 million in other sources for those projects. Um, when the bond was first proposed, we uh, and Gus said to you, we would try to achieve a three to one, you know, state funds to other sources um, uh, for that investment. In the end, it ended up being about five to one. And you might recall that when uh, Gus and I testified last week, we actually showed you a specific project example with a pie chart that showed that the state's investment to the housing revenue bond was about 20% of that total funding. Um, with We always try to achieve leverage with other sources. We were fortunate with the when the bond was issued, it was good timing because of interest rates, but also because Mora happened to get a bump in the amount of federal housing tax credits and the state housing authority got a bump um, in the um, amount of rental assistance that they could contribute to projects. So um, all those things coming together in addition to coordination between us allowed us to achieve a five to one leverage um, in that sense. One of the really exciting things about this um, um, the $20 million proposals is that it sets us up really well to take advantage of whatever federal resources may be coming along. Um, $20 million is a lot of money, but we know that the need is enormous. And if the, the, it, the state is really talking about a significant investment here and doing its part, but the federal government has not been meeting its obligations around housing um, and um, we would argue that there's, there needs to be significant investment at the federal level, whether in a new infrastructure bill or in some of the stimulus packages um, that would be made available for um, creating new homes. Um, and if with this flexible, more flexible state funding, it would allow us to um, wrap around that, fill in gaps, match if needed. Um, it just puts us in a good position in order to make the most of whatever resources may come there. I'm going to just check to look down at my notes and see what other things that you mentioned. Um, home ownership under the first housing bond. I will. Um, we did not create as many home ownership units as we would have liked, and I think there are some lessons learned there. And I think that the um, um, the governor's proposal, both in terms of the funding that would come to us, but and I think you'll probably hear more about this um, later on, the weatherization money that's proposed to go through VHFA and some of the funding through the Department of Housing and Community Development gives us some opportunities to keep working on that. Um, I think the simplest way I can describe it is that uh, there are fewer funding sources for home ownership than there are for rental housing. and especially from the federal government, it takes a lot more state money per home to make something, um, to rehab it 
and then make it affordable to someone who's low and moderate income. Um, um, so it takes a lot more investment, so it's harder to create as many units in that way, honestly. And then um, also we've had tried a couple, a number of pilot programs, and I need to check back on the specifics of that, of, of those results. Um, but while there are many homes in many parts of the state that do need rehab and could be good homes for somebody, they're not necessarily always in the places where people can get jobs, um, and they are not always necessarily places um, at a level of investment that um, where something can be made energy efficient and meet all health and safety codes and still be affordable to somebody. You have to find something that needs some work, it's in a good location, it's got transportation, um, but isn't completely falling apart. <laughs> um, so there's absolutely work to be done there. I don't want to suggest that there isn't, um, but it, it takes some good coordination and um, strategic targeting. And I would hope that we can work with VHFA and the Department of Housing and Community Development um, to do better around that um, and, and than we have in the past. VHCB has had for many, many years a shared equity program we call it the Homeland Program, where essentially we provide um, funding to the um, nonprofits that are home ownership centers and they use that for um, um, subsidy, give, give lower income um, households a grant, they go out and purchase a home um, along with the agreement that they'll share the equity um, when they eventually sell. And uh, that has been a good stepping stone from traditional rental housing to the more traditional um, and the traditional housing market. It's worked very well in some parts of the state. In some parts of the state, um, it's not as good a tool. And um, people are looking at right now to see if there are ways in which that could be um, made more effective. So I've said a lot. I think I'll pause right there um, and take the chairman's question. <laughs> um, couple of questions. Um, when we did the revenue bond last time, I assume that the monies generated from that bond were for the purposes of creating housing, but they did go from the VHFA to VHCB. Did, v, did the statute that we passed govern that all of those monies going to VHCB had to be used for housing versus your dual purpose of housing and conservation? Yes, that's right. It was the housing bond was very specifically to housing and it actually there were some income um, um, targets within that and more reference or referred to this a little bit ago. 25% of it was for housing that was more uh, moderate income or for um, and 25% uh, was to be for the uh, very, um, very lowest income households and the rest could be anywhere in between and we were able to meet meet those targets. So we know that there is a desire certainly on the governor's part to still hit both of those both of those demographics. Um, again, it takes more more um, state funding to do the um, um, the more moderate income homes because the federal programs are more targeted to um, people that are at 65% of the median or below. But one of the lessons learned from the last housing bond is that when we were thinking about worker housing, we thought that would be between 80 and 120% of median. And one of the lessons we learned is that we really should have broadened that target to be, because of the way the federal programs work, specifically more as um, federal tax credits, 65% to 120% is a better range. Okay. So my, Thank you for that. My question was more geared towards the mission of VHCB and to use funds they receive uh, as close to 50-50 for housing and conservation. And we overrode that mission on the bond. <coughs> the bond proceeds should be used exclusively for housing. And I know you haven't seen any language yet, but given that housing it seems to be is what driving the governor's suggestion for $20 million. Is he going to say that that $20 million be used exclusively for housing or is that $20 million once it gets into your hands, is it going to be $10 million to buy farms and $10 million for housing or to buy forest land and things like that? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question you asked me before, so I will answer it now. Um, so the housing revenue bond was very specific to housing. The 20 million that the governor is proposing, our understanding is that the emphasis is to be on housing, but we have talked to his staff and um, they have indicated, because we also feel like, and we touched on this um, in our testimony last week, that there are programs within VHCB that um, greatly support the rural economy and can help with the economic recovery. So we have spoken to the governor's staff around this proposal um, and um, urged that we be allowed some flexibility with that in order to fund our conservation activities um, like the farm and forest viability program, the rural economic development initiative, um, maybe outdoor recreation projects. And they, and he, and we, they have indicated to us they'd like us to have some flexibility around that. So. We, as I said, we're just beginning to discuss this with our board. We feel it's important to be able to continue to do some of those activities with this funding, um, but um, it's not set in stone. So that's, I'm afraid that's as much as I can yeah. speak well, to on that right now. It's it's brand new. Okay, well, let's not lose sight of what brought you to this point. I don't think you would have gotten twenty million dollars if it wasn't for the housing crisis. So yeah, uh, no, understood. We understand that that's the that that's the priority. Um, second, second, uh, second, excuse me, one more second, Mark, because this the next question involves you. The huge amount of money going into weatherization, which is going to be run through VHFA, I've read somewhere that the twenty or twenty-five million through that may produce as much as $70 million in weatherization projects, which is music to my ears. And is also, the weatherization is also very closely aligned with housing. So I assume that our committee will have some role in working with natural resources in terms of how we can pair those pots of money. But um, it seems like there may be some creativity going on that we're looking for here in this bill, for instance, with the weatherization money. And I'd like to hear more about why it works there and why we can't multiply here. I thought that question was gonna come at one point. Um, yes, of the $25 million investment that the governor um, proposed for weatherization, 16 million of it is slated to come to VHFA as one-time monies. The remaining nine million is going to support the existing weatherization assistance program through OEO as well as um, the state's energy management program. Um, the 16 million in one-time money that's coming to VHFA is intended to be seed money to set up VHFA for um, to be able to play a new role in the state where we can use um, weatherization resources instead of being a dollar in dollar out, which is how um, our state has traditionally used this money, instead trying to use bonding and other financial tools um, to expand the pot of money. Some of those other financial tools besides bonding could be building on existing strong programs that already exist where, um, private lenders put up their capital to support weatherization efforts. And then the public subsidy could uh, fund a loan loss reserve for those lenders so that um, there's a, a shared loss and they don't th those loans become less risky. Or the public money could be an interest rate buy down to make those um, that money more affordable to the lower income Vermonters that VHFA is dedicated to. So one of the reasons that we can take um, this smaller one-time investment and turn it into something bigger is the difference in the types of loans that we're talking about with permanently affordable housing versus weatherization project. For one, a weatherization project is usually a loan for 10 to 15 years. And so that's a much shorter term than perpetual. Uh, so therefore, weatherization doesn't come with the um, longer lasting affordability provisions. So there's less of public subsidy going to support the weatherization because it helps that household. It will help the next households who buy that home, 
but there, and so the affordability remains by the ongoing lower utility bills, but it's not the same kind of uh, income-based affordability protections that's so important in um, the housing that VHCB and VHFA traditionally create in the ways we've been talking about. Also, um, there is a difference with um, weatherization loans are a bit more, even if they're just a 0% interest rate, because we can buy down that interest rate, they are still paid back when at least the home sells, if not principal payments for those 10 to 15 years. And um, that's different than traditional uh, the creation of affordable rental housing, where to remain affordable to tenants in perpetuity, that investment needs to stay in that community, in that housing. And so um, it's more likely, I think that the better equation of what we're hoping to do with the weatherization investment probably looks more a bit like our VHFA's down payment assistance program where we give a household some money, but then eventually they do pay it back and we're revolving that assistance to help more households. We're not keeping that investment in that one property. So those are some of the reasons why you can't give us $20 million and we can turn it into a hundred of one-time money. It's just a different beast. Um, it's a different mechanism to do shorter term lending that gets repaid versus the kind of deep investment that we're making in our downtowns and communities through the housing created through the last housing bond. Well, I'm not sure I follow all that. I'm stuck on the 16 million versus 20 million and they're very similar numbers. Some of the differences you talk about uh, the housing bond could be uh, brought down in terms of its perpetual affordability requirements and lengths of the loans. There could be tweaks that could make it very comparable to the weatherization and maybe we wouldn't get the ideal bond for housing, but... Um, but if I may, I, I really, I, I'd like I'm to- very, I'm, very, I'm very concerned, I'm skeptical that more can't be done with the $20 million, especially when there's, uh, and I would like, we'll hear from the treasurer why she's, I guess, on board with a $16 million uh, program for weatherization that doesn't affect debt service of the state of Vermont, but yet $20 million in a second housing bond is a non-starter for her. Because I think it's important, I really want to get to clarity on this, um, and it may take more than one conversation, but um, a weatherization loan gets repaid every month. And so we can use those loan repayments to pay the bond holders. A PTT bond loan is not repaid every month by the housing property. And so it needs another source to repay those investors. So it uses the PTT revenue. So that is what makes that an ongoing obligation of the state. Um, weatherization loans get repaid every month and are of a much shorter term. And so after that loan term is done, we can use that money to um, make another loan. That's very different when Jen talks about the tremendous leverage that VHCB achieved. It's because the um, state tax credit program and the federal tax credit program, which all require perpetual affordability, were um, the, the main source of money for these projects. So when VHFA awards federal tax credits, it pays for 70% of the cost of construction and we require with that program perpetual affordability. And so that housing has to remain affordable. And so uh, VHCB is limited in how much they can make loans that get repaid monthly, like a weatherization loan, because uh, that money, that project, I'm sorry, that housing development needs to remain affordable. And the more that there's debt that those projects have to pay back, the less affordable that housing gets. 
And so it um, would not, if, if a PTT bond, if the $20 million turned into a bond and was um, made bigger, it would not be as valuable because the housing development would have to make monthly mortgage payments to pay back that loan over that loan term. And to pay that mortgage payment, the rents would have to be higher. Well, I guess uh, I have a lot more questions, uh, even if the rents would have to be higher, uh, if it triples the amount of housing that we can develop, maybe it doesn't quadruple or, or quintuple the amount of housing, but it produces still a multiple of housing. Maybe that's a trade-off that we would be willing to, to live with. So, I mean, I think we just need to think outside the box and uh, it's food for thought. We'll talk some more. You're right. It is uh, uh, an interesting comparison, I think, uh, that we need to hear a little bit more about. So I think I probably with one point of good news, um, just I don't want to leave on a, on a down note, I want to point out to you that in the past, I have made your eyes water with confusion about various tax credit, federal tax credit programs, and I'm not going to do that. But I want you to know that there are Two, we've talked about how there's two types of tax credits. One is very valuable and limited. And the other one, the treasurer points out to you repeatedly, is pretty much unlimited in Vermont. Yet then I show up and say, yeah, but it's not that valuable. The federal government late in December with the stimulus and the budget, they fixed a systematic problem with that less valuable credit. And it bumps up the value, not as high as the first credit, but it still really improves the program. And what we know is that right now, the projects, the housing projects that are in the queue that have been approved by VHFA or about to be approved in the next month or two, that means another $6.8 million of money for housing in Vermont, which is gonna help 467 households in 11 different communities across the state. And those are just the approvals that we have in the pipeline right now. That's going to be a, a ongo that's a permanent fix to this program so that every year this um, federal tax credit program is going to remain more valuable to housing in Vermont. So this is now a more meaningful program upon which a state investment could be leveraged. And so it's a it's a great thing for Vermont. And I know that Jen and Gus and I have already been talking about ways that we can try to make sure that we're being really smart about pairing these um, resources together. And so I just want to end on a good note that that would be a wonderful resource with whatever housing investments uh, the state makes to use that program, those 4% tax credits as um, a more valuable leveraging tool. For All the parallel that, that is good news. What's the name of the tax credit? What's Everyone calls it the 4% federal tax credit compared to the 9% credits, which are that more valuable competitive one. But the 4% credits are the ones that uh, Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch all really have championed for fixing this problem for years, and they finally got over the finish line for us. Could you send us a, a link to a description of the program and the changes that have been made? I'm sure. If I may, I'd rather write one myself because all the links... Yeah. Your eyes really okay. water so okay and, and, sounds great her gift of translating it will be helpful does yeah. anybody have any more questions for our witnesses we're at our bathroom break for 10 minutes now uh and we if not we'll see you all at 9 40 or 9 40. we do have more questions but at another time okay good morning everybody we're about to get started um, okay, let me uh, begin by saying how we're gonna conduct this round table. Thank you all for being here and being available to participate. Um, there's a lot of us, so I'm not gonna go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves, but when you do get your first opportunity to speak, if you could introduce yourself and tell us your 
position and your role would be very helpful. Um, what I'm gonna, uh, how I'd like to structure this is I'm gonna have, I've just given Josh <laughs> a very short heads up that I'd like him to start and just give us a five minute preview of the governor's new housing initiatives in the budget bill and the state of affairs of some of the ongoing uh, housing programs from the uh, most recent two COVID bills. And then we'll turn it over to the congressional delegation to get their view of things of um, what's in the late December bill, what might be in the uh, president's new bill and some of the parameters, restrictions, opportunities, what they're looking about, looking at what's being talked about. And then after we get that overview, which probably will take about 20 minutes total, um, we'll move into having a more free flowing discussion. I think Nathan sent you all out. What I'm hoping to get at here is um, how we can think outside the box and develop some housing policies for the state of Vermont that maximizes access to affordable housing. Uh, we'll break at, that'll be about uh, 40, uh, we'll break at 10.30 for 10 minutes and we'll come back for 25 minutes after that. And then we'll move into homelessness prevention witnesses. So with that said, thank you again for all being here. And Josh, could you introduce yourself and get us launched? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, for the record, uh, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, happy to, to talk with folks this morning. And I'll, I'll just kick things off quickly just by saying that, you know, in my more than or close to 20 years of doing uh, housing work in Vermont, I've never seen, you know, more opportunity before us um, than we have right now. And at the same time, more um, need to act quickly and, 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 and get to work and, and do what needs to be done out there. Um, you know, there is a gap right now in the money available to uh, both landlords that are housing people with um, sort of no recourse for no, non-payment of rent and of course tenants that need resources to pay their rent not to um, fall into worse financial hardship. So with that, um, stage, uh, just quickly run through the housing related items that were in the governor's proposal. I'll start with a few that maybe are not on the top of this committee's, uh, this group's list and this round table, but do, do impact uh, in a very positive way housing. So there was a, um, a $1.75 million uh, increase to ongoing increase to the neighborhood, to the downtown tax credits which is specifically to expand those into the neighborhood, neighborhood development areas. So um, that's a piece of, of, of housing work that we hope um, uh, is supported and, and we can do that ongoing. There was also the um, Vermont Warms program and involvement with VHFA um, and others were 25 million for weatherization, which much most of that touches housing, um, about 16 million carved out for Vermont Housing Finance Agency to work on weatherizing low and moderate income homes uh, and apartments. Another four million for um, programs in AHS with the uh, low income heating assistance program for uh, fuel switching um, and, and system switching. And another five million that really isn't housing but for municipal buildings to do weatherization. And then Getting into more of the specific areas um, that we're gonna talk about more is uh, an additional 3 million for the Vermont Housing Investment Program. Um, three of that is one time at dollars and 1 million of that is in our base uh, for ongoing uh, um, support. Um, and that is split between rental assistance, not rental assistance, uh, rental rehab of apartments that are, you know, vacant, uh, offline, you know, code deficiencies, as well as a homeowner, new homeowner purchase rehab with a set aside or um, a um, target for uh, BIPOC uh, community in Vermont. 
Then we also have the mobile home replacement tax credit. Um, there's an increase there specifically for that of uh, $250,000 of ongoing support to um, you know, more than double the resources that are going into that successful program year over year. Um, you know, as a reminder, those, those credits are sold uh, by the HFA and the proceeds granted to Champlain Housing Trust, which runs a statewide program to replace old, um, you know, um, non-energy efficient mobile homes with um, new Energy Star and um, zero energy modular homes across the state. It acts as a 0% uh, deferred uh, second mortgage that's paid back upon sale or transfer and that money recycles. And it's um, uh, essentially a self-sustaining program at this point um, that does a lot of good work across the state. And then there's the um, governor's proposal to uh, significantly increase VHCB's budget um, this year, uh, bringing it up to, um, it's actually $30.8 million as I've looked into the details. Um, so a more than $20 million increase um, over last year's uh, budget. So hopefully that rounds out um, the sort of housing proposals uh, that the governor presented and, and kicks us off for some discussion. Is that what you're hoping for, Senator Schrocken? You're exactly. muted, Michael. Exactly. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Josh. Okay, let's move on to the congressional delegation. We'll go by seniority, Polly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Polly Major. I'm a field representative for Senator Leahy covering housing here in Vermont. And uh, thank you for inviting us all in. I think how we are going to divide up our congressional update is all give an overview of the bill that was passed in December. Uh, Alex Beaton from Senator Sanders' office will talk about uh, Biden's proposal for new coronavirus legislation. And uh, Rebecca Ellis from Congressman Welch's office will talk about how we're working with Treasury on the rental assistance program that was authorized in December. So I can start us off. I shared with, uh, with the committee a federal housing resources document that my office put together that outlines the federal housing resources in the bill passed in December. So the December bill was really in three parts. You had the FY21 appropriations, the funding for the government for this year. There was a portion of the bill that was authorizing um, language relating to existing and new programs. And then there was the $900 billion uh, coronavirus relief package, the second package that we've seen. For the fiscal year 21 appropriations section of that bill, this was the second year of a two-year budget agreement. So we didn't have a lot of big changes in the fed federal funding for housing programs. You can see in the document that I've shared, we've laid out what the major housing programs received in fiscal year 20 versus fiscal year 21. Um, small increases, but fairly steady across the board. So if you're looking ahead at what Vermont expects to receive in this upcoming year, you can um, really use what it received last year as uh, a proxy. So I just want to give the committee that sense. There's a lot of individual programs, so I'm not gonna run through them all, um, but I, I wanted to provide that context around the, the fiscal year 21 budget. Senator Leahy was uh, vice chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee as they negotiated this bill. And uh, he said he was glad to put a final nail in the coffin of the Trump budget proposals that have gutted most of these housing programs. So we're glad to see they still exist. And he's looking for it forward to serving as chair of the Appropriations Committee moving forward and strengthening our country's investments in housing. For the coronavirus portion of that bill, there, the program that's probably of most interest to this committee is the uh, rental housing assistance, emergency rental uh, assistance program. And this program is authorized through the Treasury Department, much like the coronavirus relief fund. However, it is has some real significant differences from the CRF fund. 
Uh, it's a much more defined and rigid program with specific uh, language in the bill about how it needs to be implemented in the state. So through that program, there's $25 billion nationally, and there's a small state minimum that ensures that Vermont will receive and has received $200 million to implement that program. Uh, I do want to flag for this committee some of the uh, eligibility requirements that are outlined again in the statute that set this program apart from Vermont's existing rental assistance program that you all stood up with CRF dollars. So the most significant difference is that there is means testing um, and included in this program. So to be eligible to receive this funding, renter or households must be at or below 80% AMI. They also have to be able to show that they have some financial hardship that's related to COVID, though there's certainly room for interpretation about what that looks like. Um, the bill also prioritizes for funding for households that are below 50% AMI and those experiencing unemployment. The $200 million, well, well wonderful, does come with some very strict deadlines uh, that are coming up pretty quickly. The first deadline is September 30th, 2021 where the bill says that the secretary shall recapture excess funds and reallocate those funds to grantees who have obligated 65% of their allocation or more, uh, which should mean that Vermont, in order to receive funding past September, will need to have spent down that 65% of the 200 million. Uh, after September, the secretary has some discretion on how the funds are reallocated. Um, the reallocation is based on demonstrated need within the district or a jurisdiction, but it doesn't. The statute doesn't define what what that looks like and how those funds will be reallocated. Once they are reallocated, the funds are available through December thirtieth, twenty twenty one, with an option for grantees to request a ninety day extension. So, this is a short term rental program um, that is targeted to households that are below 80% AMI. And, and those two things really set it apart from the program Vermont stood up with CRF. So I want to flag that and I'm sure we'll have lots more discussion on what that means for the state and what that looks like as we try to implement this program. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague in Senator Sanders' office. Thank you, Polly. Alex. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Beaton. I'm a policy advisor for Senator Sanders and the Senate Budget Committee based in the DC office, although I am a proud Vermont native. Um, so happy to walk through um, what President Biden has put out so far and kind of some of the next steps in Congress as we look forward um, to the current session. Um, so as you all know, and I believe Polly shared a document with the committee um, on this, um, you know, the president released a plan that would spend 1.9 trillion, um, the American Rescue Plan related to kind of the immediate public health needs, including vaccination, economic support for working families and aid to communities. Um, wanted to highlight some items of interest um, to the committee and for this round table. Um, an additional 25 billion in funding for emergency rental assistance. 5 billion in additional funding uh, to secure stable housing for persons experiencing or risk of experiencing homelessness. Uh, the plan calls on Congress to extend the federal eviction and foreclosure moratorium through at least September. Um, you know, however, that would likely not affect states like Vermont that have their own moratoriums in the books. 350 billion in additional funding to state and local governments to ensure they don't need to decrease public services or cut public jobs in order to keep up with just, um, the rising needs like distributing the vaccine, reopening schools and other services. So, you know, the president's plan is, as you all see from the document, um, you know, it's, it's only 19 pages. It's mainly focused on kind of these top line numbers. So it will be left to Congress to kind of sort out the parameters of these various programs. Um, we certainly have heard and, and hope to continue to hear from you all 
um, some of the needs for Vermont and, and issues with the existing programs um, that I think Rebecca will speak to um, that we'll keep in mind as we shape the programs. Um, so I think some of the issues around the rental assistance program that Congress will consider things like the, the time limit and recapture provisions for rental payments, um, uh, other, other aspects of that program. So looking forward to hearing more from you all about that. So you know, Congress is going to need to take this plan and turn it into legislation. I think we are actively keeping the March 14th deadline um, for the expiration of the enhanced unemployment benefits in mind. <clears throat> Um, and as we continue this process, you know, it's certainly our hope, certainly President Biden's hope that this relief will be passed on a bipartisan basis. And I understand some of those discussions are already in the early phases, but we should know more soon. Um, but I would say, you know, if not, you know, as the incoming chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Senator Sanders is prepared to use the budget reconciliation process to pass COVID relief. Um, reconciliation is a special congressional budget tool that allows us to pass you know, budgetary legislation on a fast track basis um, without um, being subject to the 60 vote filibuster in the Senate. So happy to answer any questions about that. Um, but looking a little longer term, we also expect President Biden to release a recovery plan based on his Build Back Better plan he discussed during the campaign. <clears throat> and that plan we expect to be largely focused on kind of investments in infrastructure and, and addressing climate change. And this could be an opportunity for efforts on things like housing capital investments, um, and other energy efficiency and weatherization programs. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague in uh, Congresswoman, Congressman Welch's office. So Alex, I have one question. Uh, the Is there a small state minimum proposed or is for the next bill, or is that always the case that there's a small state minimum in these kinds of bills? Uh, I would say that the Biden plan does not address a small state minimum. He has left that up to Congress. Um, but you know, it certainly has always been um, Senator Sanders' hope that you know we ensure that that states like Vermont with lower populations uh, receive their fair share of funding. And could you just give us, in terms of additional rental assistance, I think you had a number in there. What would that do? You, do you know what that would translate to for Vermont and additional funds if there was a small state minimum and if there was not a small state minimum? Uh, you know, I don't think those details have been put out by, you know, those are still being considered by Congress. If we adopt the 25 billion recommendation from the president, what the small state minimum would look like. Um, so I don't want to give you all a number and then it will change in the coming weeks. So well, well, I'll definitely well, let you all know. For this, for any, what, what was the overall number in the December bill for rent assistance. Was that 25 billion as well? Okay. Yes. So, you know, okay. if that is precedent, then that $200 million small state minimum could continue. But, you know, again, this would be subject to another round of congressional negotiation. So that, that could certainly change. Okay. Okay. Rebecca, good to see you. I'm not sure you've ever testified before our committee before, but Good to have you back in the state house virtually. <laughs> virtually here. Well, thank you. It's fun to be here. So for the record, my name is Rebecca Ellis and I'm state the state director for Congressman Welch. It's um it's fun to be here today. And the congressman says hello to everyone. Um and he wanted to also uh, mention that he was able to visit the Holiday Inn in Burlington in I think it was October. Um, where CBOEO um, had um, created um, housing for homeless and people facing um, housing instability. And he found this um, really an inspiring visit. And um, overall, he's just been so impressed with all the work that all of the partners here on this call today um, have done to find creative ways to help people who are facing housing instability. And I was on a call a couple months ago um, I don't remember who it was who said it, but um, I think it was someone on this panel, um, just mentioned the fact that housing instability is really facing so many um, people these days. And the, the face of housing instability is really diverse now um, from young people facing student debt um, to middle-aged people who lost their jobs to older Vermonters who are on um, fixed incomes. So, it's really a problem across the state and for all people. Um, 
The congressman has really been um, pushing hard for more money to go into the coronavirus relief fund. Um, as I think you know, Vermont was allocated $1.25 billion um, in March through the CARES Act, and that has really helped the state through this, uh, this, this period and this hardship, and, um, and, and hopefully we'll get more of that type of money because it is that flexible money that comes to the state that allows the state to continue funding programs that really work for the state of Vermont. Um, and so, as Polly has already mentioned, um, there was uh, this great program, the, two, the 25 billion nationally or $200 million for Vermont for the emergency rental assistance program. Um, but that does come with some pretty strict um, guides that have to be worked out. And um, Congressman Welch did meet in late December with Commissioner Hanford and with housing um, stakeholders and partners to talk a little bit about that program um, and to hear from folks what their concerns were. Um, and the department has provided us with, um, and the delegation with five pages of questions about how that program is gonna work. And unfortunately, we really don't have the answers quite yet to those questions. Um, but suffice it to say, it will not probably be as flexible as the money that came through the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, and some of the big questions that uh, have already been hinted at um, are, how to define eligibility um, and what is the paperwork requirement for meeting eligibility? Um, what is gonna be the definition of other housing expenses? Um, there is some allowance for money uh, to go to other housing expenses, but depending on how that's interpreted, it could uh, create opportunity in Vermont or, or not. Um, and so we'll really just have to see how that comes out the Trump administration on the day before it left office, so on the 19th, issued a four page frequently asked questions um, on, through the Treasury Department. And I think most people felt that those guidelines really didn't answer any questions. And if they did anything, they made it harder to access this money than necessary. Congressman Welch um, joined a letter yesterday asking the Treasury Department to rescind those four pages of frequently asked questions and just start anew. Um, the delegation has um, been seeking out contacts at, with the new administration at the Treasury and um, Senator Leahy's office was able to get an answer within one day yesterday, or at least a response, maybe not an answer, but provided the questions from the department to the new treasury, I got a response within a one day, which is really promising. Um, even if not all the answers are exactly what we want, at least we're getting some answers. So um, the other sort of route that we have for working on getting regulations is through the um, Senate Banking Committee who has a uh, direct line with the Treasury Department to implement the program. So again, the Senate offices um, are working directly with the Senate Banking Committee. And um, so I think that's it for the update. And just to stress that um, Congressman Welch certainly knows that the flexible money is the preferred money and we'll continue fighting for that. Um, Chair Sorotkin, you had a question about how much money would come to the state of Vermont with the new, um, the Biden proposal. The CARES Act had, the CARES 2.0 Act had um, a similar amount of money devoted to states and local governments. And the total amount that came to the state and local governments was around $800 million. That, those were the last estimates that I saw, just to give you a ballpark idea of what, how much money um, has been floated in the recent proposals. Um, so thank you and I look forward to your questions and thanks for having the delegation here today. Is there any way to translate that 800 million to what piece of um, piece of that pot would be for rent assistance? Yeah, so that would that would be the equivalent equivalent of the money that came to the state in the coronavirus relief fund. So you would compare that to the 1.25 billion and you know there was pretty um, uh, you know, there were some guidelines to that, but it was, there was a lot of discretion given to the state on where to allocate the money. And so the same would be for this, this pot of money. Right. But that would, that was subject to the small state minimum, the 1.25. That's why we got so much money. And the 
small state minimum would be 800 million in this second COVID, but I'm just wondering if we didn't get the small state minimum, what Vermont would get in rental assistance. People are saying 200 million under the small state minimum, but I assume it's far less if we don't get that small state minimum for, for rental assistance. So, the, um, so there's two different pots of money. Um, so there was the 25 billion um, proposed by President Biden for rental assistance where there may or may not be a small state minimum. And there was also, um, Alex gave the full number, it was somewhere in the 350 billion that right. would go to state and local governments. And um, on that, again, there's no, um, for the President yeah. Biden's proposal, we don't really have a breakdown but, or a small state minimum at this point. But the last time that 350 billion number was being floated around, it translated to about a total of 800 million to the state of Vermont in both state and local, uh, for both state and local governments. Okay. Um, just before we leave this, uh, and we'll, we'll probably be talking about that, this, but if the, if the goal of a small state minimum under the Biden, uh, under the December bill is to be achieved the, uh, with some degree of certainty, the Biden bill has to, put, as one avenue, has to extend greater flexibility to the funds from the COVID-2 bill in December. Um, it's probably a naive question. I don't know how Washington works, but do people respond to that kind of argument. You know, you wanted to give us this amount of money in December. It's not working for us. So we need to correct that. Um, or is that just a totally a political question? I think well, if we look, yeah, go ahead. I go think ahead, if we Polly. look at the national context um, with many states that did not do what Vermont did and stand up a rental assistance program, there is a lot of need out there. Um, so I, I think from a national perspective, altering the rental assistance program is going to be difficult because I know there are advocates that um, are pushing hard for that income eligibility that is in there. Um, so certainly we, from a Vermont perspective, would like to see additional flexibility, but um, I'm not sure how likely that is to go into a next bill. Um, and I think where our bosses are going to be focusing, or my boss is going to be focusing, and Rebecca said the same about Congressman Welch, is getting additional state and local aid that really has that flexibility that uh, Vermont needs and has done such a great job with in the past. Okay. Okay, we're going to uh, open it up to um, the rest of the folks in the round table. And uh, uh, a person that might be a good place to start, but anybody can jump in with questions or comments would be uh, Richard Williams and the challenges he sees uh, as the opportunities and the challenges that he sees uh, with this $200 million that has come in the December bill and what the, where, you are and the other stakeholders in Vermont are in assessing that at the present time. Good morning, uh, uh, Senate committee members. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanna say thank you to this committee and to the leadership, uh, especially uh, Senator Srotkin over the, over the years that uh, you've always been strong and loud and have always supported, a, you know, a, housing for Vermonters. And, and uh, we always look forward to testifying before you, even though you ask some pretty tough questions. Uh, so uh, I will tell you what, uh, what we know at this time uh, regarding the, uh, the $200 million. Um, you know, I think you've heard from other testimony that uh, it's gonna be less flexible than the CF dollars that we've received uh, earlier. Uh, as you know, we were successfully ran uh, rental assistance, a rearage program. Uh, this committee worked uh, well with us and Vermont Legal Aid and Vermont Landlords Associations. And, and uh, 
like many states, there was restrictions on how far rental rearage went back. Uh, a lot of them chose not before March 1st. Vermont uh, stood up there as different, much more flexible, realizing that, you know, uh, low income renters had problems prior to COVID, you know, paying paying rent in Vermont. You know, we have high we have high rents in Vermont. I think everybody knows that. And many were behind uh, even prior to COVID. Uh, this committee took the position and the legislature took the position that uh, it was housing and health. Uh, it was important not to uh, evict anyone or create a homeless situation, especially during the COVID period. And uh, as a result of that, I think the program was successful. And that's why we're asking you to give us $2.8 million so we can fund the uh, last 1,500 applications that we have on the table. Uh, some of the congressional testimony you've already heard about the, uh, the Biden uh, proposal, and that $25 billion, I think, will come down in the way of uh, the regular federal programs. And uh, it will be, a, from what I've been reading, it will be like the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And that will be allocated uh, to local housing authorities and to other entities that administer the Housing Choice Voucher Program uh, on a national basis. And, and here in Vermont, it's, it's obviously my agency, along with eight, uh, eight other public housing authorities. Uh, there won't be a lot of flexibility with that, but there is <clears throat> the benefit of receiving it, uh, by the way, of Housing Choice Vouchers is that we can make those into project-based vouchers. There's a there percentage that uh, under the rules and regulations and the laws under the HUD program that allows us to make a uh, basically 25% of our allocation of our total housing choice voucher program. And we can allocate that towards project-based vouchers. And if you really wanna get affordable housing in Vermont, you need to combine rental assistance along with uh, you know, mortgage monies and the low income housing tax credits and BHCB funding and, and uh, CDBG. Uh, you need all those sources of fund really to create affordable housing here in the state of Vermont. But rental assistance is really critical if you're gonna serve the low income housing population. Uh, typically, you know, we're uh, assisting, you know, uh, as high as 75% of our money is under the Section 8 voucher program, go to folks below 30% of medium income. And uh, without that assistance, as much as uh, the tax credit program is a great production program, uh, without rental assistance, many of those folks wouldn't be able to get into that beautiful housing that's being uh, developed by for-profits and, and nonprofits here in Vermont. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, uh, the $200 billion will be will frankly be a challenge for Vermont to spend under the current FAQs, as was mentioned, that was issued the day before the president left the office. Uh, these uh, FAQs were uh, were issued in, in uh, as, as it was already previously said, probably has caused more confusion than it has helped. So we, uh, we have been working, you know, with the administration uh, and Agency of Commerce Community Development uh, has been putting together uh, uh, many, many questions that now our congressional folks are, are submitting to our, our new treasurer of, and secretary. And uh, we're all hoping for more flexibility, but we also understand that the act really sets the guidelines. There's a lot of statutory changes that we think uh, would be helpful to make, but uh, I think the likelihood of those getting those statutory changes uh, would be very difficult and is probably not the time to open that up uh, for discussion. Uh, hopefully maybe some, some changes may be able to come through the budget process uh, later, but that's gonna be very late, uh, as you know, uh, in 2021 when we will see a federal budget. But uh, hopefully that there can be some extensions to this money. Uh, Senator Reed from Rhode Island uh, originally uh, had pushed uh, that grantees have until December of 2022 to obligate the funds and had an additional 90 days uh, to, uh, to expend that money. So there are, and also Senator Reed from Rhode Island, uh, why I'm mentioning Rhode Island, uh, some of you may remember Amy Raynone, 
that worked for Senator Leahy's office probably 20 years ago. Uh, Amy works for the Rhode Island Housing Authority as their legislative uh, director in policy. Uh, so Amy and I have been keeping in touch. As you know, she's a Vermonter from St. Johnsbury as well. Uh, they uh, haven't been able to be as flexible as the state of Vermont. They've been sort of under a gag order of not asking a lot of questions, uh, you know, from their administrations and such. Fortunately in Vermont, uh, uh, we're not afraid to ask questions. So uh, uh, Commissioner Hanford has been asking a lot of questions. So we do have a lot of, a lot of recommendations. We'd like to see the assistance uh, extended from, you know, 18 to 24 months right now, it's 12 months uh, and potentially with an additional three months um, but our challenge is we'll be getting that money out the door quickly. And uh, so we're working with you folks. Uh, we'd asked, we were invited into the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee by Senator Kitchell about two weeks ago, uh, Ms. Commissioner Hanford and myself. And uh, they put me on the spot. They says, uh, how much money would you like? And I said, well, I'd like a placeholder of $50 million to begin with. Uh, I thought that was a reasonable amount to ask for out of the 200 million. And it's twice what we spent in six months. So it seemed like it was a realistic number to ask for. We could then uh, start setting up this program, which is gonna be ex uh, very expensive. Uh, as I said, there's less flexibility. Uh, there's lots of, you know, uh, in our past program, you know, we relied on self-certification. Uh, we're, we're asking for that now. Uh, and I'm not sure if we're gonna get that or not, but if we have to, to do all the means testing and we have to verify you know, W-2s and unemployment, uh, you know, through third parties or whatever, that's, it's just gonna drag and slow down the program. But so uh, I've had conversations with Commissioner Hanford about trying to combine uh, Section 8 funding, you know, the Housing Choice Vouchers with a rental rehab program, uh, HUD. Uh, if she can look at my face, she can say how old I am. Uh, I've been around here a long time and can remember when HUD actually had a program uh, that combine rental subsidies with, uh, uh, with capital dollars. And uh, Vermont did receive allocations of that and it was a successful program. And uh, sometimes when you have successful programs, they get canceled because they cost too much. So uh, something similar like that in Vermont, I think would be, would, be, uh, would be very helpful because of the program that we're just wrapping up there rental housing uh, stabilization program. A lot of landlords have a lot of vacant units out there. They do not have money to make those repairs. Uh, and anything that we could do to help them uh, would, would help with the shortage of affordable housing here in Vermont. And we need all, we need everyone. We need nonprofits, we need for-profits. We all need to be working on this problem. But the clear thing is we have a definitely uh, a shortage in housing and affordable housing uh, for low-income families. We didn't do a means testing through the rental housing stabilization program, but we did ask them to, you know, kind of indicate where their income was for their household. And I can tell you that they're very low uh, to low-income folks that we serve through that program. I'll stop because I know you got a lot of people here and always available to you folks. Mr. Chair, you're on mute, and I also have a question. <laughs> Thank you. I'll get, I just wanted to say that um, uh, this is the first of many conversations on this topic, and uh, there's many interest groups that uh, have contacted us that want to be part of this discussion, including uh, realtors and local uh, public housing uh, authorities, some regional groups, and we will have all those people in the discussion as we move forward. Uh, I'll take your question in a second, Senator Rahm, but um, that's a good start. What, what I wrote to folks is that um, we want to uh, make as strong of an effort as possible to use all these resources that are available to us. My understanding is that this group of people here has been meeting with the commissioner uh, on a weekly basis or whatever. And we wanna be, this committee wants to be abre kept abreast of what those conversations are. So this, hopefully the rest of this half hour or 
45 minutes that we may have, we can start brainstorming about ideas of which way we can somehow gain greater flexibility. We've already heard of a, a few ideas, but we'd like people to weigh in. Nothing's beyond the bounds of discussion here. It's just a brainstorming session, uh, but our committee needs to hear what you folks have been, you experts have been thinking about um, as to how we can maximize the use at the very least of that 200 million dollars. Senator Rahm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think I know we have Champlain Housing Trust here. I don't know what it means to not have Burlington and Winooski housing authorities here just in the kind of framing around how to help particularly low income BIPOC families. I feel like they have a very high concentration of those folks who might benefit from a program to transition them to home ownership. Um, I think that would probably end up being pretty concentrated in Chittenden County. And so it, I think we need to also address that it's hard to have BIPOC people move their lives to somewhere more rural in Vermont if they're not feeling safe or connected to community. Um, so wanted to flag that and um, just say, cause it's it's a pet issue of mine that I'm, I really like Senator Sanders signing on to something that would look like the green um, workforce in, in the, uh, New York City area that helps get lo people in low income housing into jobs that fix up housing, weatherize housing, and you know help help them um, maybe do the rehab projects as well. So just trying to think about how we get really creative to make sure this works for people of color and people in um, affordable housing to access jobs and home ownership. If I could quickly uh, respond to you, Senator Senator Rom. Uh, through the uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program, the federal federal program, uh, there is a home ownership program uh, with that. So where that they can actually use that voucher to pay for, for mortgage and you know, cost of home ownership. Vermont, Vermont State Housing Authority has had a successful uh, uh, successful run with that money and have, have created a lot of great opportunities. and. And I think there's, there's, uh, you know, I'm sure we could uh, team up a lot of folks in Vermont Housing Finance Agency and and others that are on this and uh, and uh, be pretty pretty creative. We've we've also worked very closely with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, Rural Development. Uh, uh, we've worked very closely with their home ownership programs and have many people that receive mortgages through through that uh, federal agency uh, and uh, and in using this voucher you know, as, as flexible as we can. It's, it has created a lot of, a lot of housing opportunities that home ownership opportunities that wouldn't have happened. Thank you. Um, Michael Monty. Senator Sorokin, thank you for this opportunity. Senator Rahm, thank you for the question. Um, we have done more uh, um, access to vouchers for home ownership uh, than anyone nationally. The Belton Housing Authority itself has been very active working with us on doing that. We also take um, the importance of taking, of getting folks who are uh, people of color into home ownership into our rental housing. A good, a good number of our rental housing properties do have people of color, and about 25% of the sales of our home ownership over the last five years have been for people of color. So we are, we le are leaning into it. I was late for this meeting because I was in a, at the Vermont Housing Conservation Board uh, meeting, and we we do have the support of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency on this one. I want to. Thank Maura for that, to actually do a very specific project in Winooski to support uh, people of color moving into home ownership. And we are looking for ways um, night and day to be able to do this uh, within the context of remarkably enough, you know, the, 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 the federal laws that, that, that discriminate uh, against people. So we are working through that and doing uh, working through their various group, Racial Justice Alliance. I had a conversation with Mark yesterday. Uh, we're working with an AALV and a range of others to really move that as best as we can and as strongly as we can. Uh, so we take that to heart and be glad to have a conversation with you about the work we're doing with the city of Winooski and um, in Burlington also. Um, if I could just reflect on what um, Dick Williams has said, um, I think. Uh, that with the $200 um, million, I think flexibility is the key word here. Uh, Self-certification is really important. It's been, it was difficult to go through the process we went through. 
um, in the last six months. That money was essential for renters, uh, for our renters and for our properties in order for us to be successful, but for landlords and renters across the state. Um, it was still nevertheless pretty flexible relatively in terms of how it was gonna work compared to the new rules. And so for the, our delegation here and, and, our, and I think our delegation in Washington, uh, allowing for self-certification uh, for our tax credit properties, allowing for different systems to, uh, to allow people to get that at rental pro uh, assistance more easily is gonna be key. The second part of that flexibility is in terms of timing. I agree with Dick also, more time, the better. The other part of that flexibility is we may not use that $200 million. And, and frankly, in uh, Chittenden County, our issue as much as anything is production, we need more of that. We have a 1.5% vacancy rate as of June, still, no matter how many units we built over the last few years of private sector housing and even affordable housing, the vacancy rate went down again. People are moving here. If you go to Reddit, which I do on occasion, I don't want to admit that too much, it's remarkable how many folks are moving to, to uh, Vermont because it's easier and better here than it is from the communities that they're escaping from. Um, the impact and the demands on the market are strong. And uh, I think Mara could speak to, I think she has a number of 2,000 new households being formed, I think, in Chittenden County over the next five years. I think I got that correct. If that's the case, um, and we're lagging in production this past year um, and may in the future, frankly, we're going to be uh, not get out of the continued need for uh, for production. So production uh, with programs that Dick runs and the housing authorities run uh, and, and services, depending upon the population of people we are working with, are all sort of critical pieces. And flexibility in that $200 million or the next round of stimulus money is really going to be important. Um, so we just, uh, that's, that would be my pitch, uh, for you, for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very helpful. That's exactly what I wanted to hear is starting to get a laundry list of ideas. Uh, I've heard some, some others out of the box, like paying for the shelter allowance for TANF recipients out of this, freeing up perhaps general fund dollars or, uh, the impact this might have on the renter's rebate program. If people's rent is paid, uh, is there money to be used there? Those kinds of ideas. Uh, so it's, it's our, about our break time. We'll take 10 minutes now, unless somebody has a pressing question, and we'll come back for about a half hour. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, come back for about a half hour and wrap up. We'll hear from everybody who's on the call, but please uh, we want to focus on creative thinking of ideas of how we can uh, get some greater flexibility into this uh, Thank you Ms. very much. Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator Ballant. You know, I don't okay, see just I don't briefly see before hands. we... <laughs> I know that's because I'm a I'm a disembodied voice. Um, before we go to the break, I just want to mention one thing that um, I was reflecting on with uh, our money chairs yesterday, and in, in thinking about the the budget address that we heard, is that I want all of us on this committee to really see that budget address from the governor as a, a reflection of a point in time. And what I mean by that is. Over the next few weeks and months, we're going to probably be getting more federal funds. And so I want us to make a laundry list of, of creative ideas for the money that we know that we have right now. But I also would love to have a, a, an additional list, which is, you know, what are we going to do and in what order if more flexible funds come to us in Vermont? Because I, I, I feel pretty strongly that that will happen at some point. Just wanted to make that plug. Yeah, I agree. You and I have talked a bunch, and I know we're in agreement about this moving target phenomenon, and it's really hard to lock on a decision when the the, the sands are going to shift underneath your feet at any moment. So uh, exactly. we're on the page, right. and uh, we will definitely be keeping that in mind. So we'll see see everybody in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So I want to make sure everybody gets who was invited gets a chance to speak. We have about 35 minutes left before we hear from 
homelessness advocates at 1115. Um, let me just go around and, and uh, uh, pick people to add to the conversation um, from where we were going with any thoughts they may have. Uh, I'm gonna suggest we start with Maura. I'm happy to jump in, although you hear from me a lot. So I think there's a lot of people just out of fairness. Um, I'll just say briefly um, in support of what Michael was saying about the strong need and demand and appreciate, well, let me slow down. The appreciation for this committee for so doggedly pursuing this topic year after year and not giving up because the need has clearly not gone away yet. Um, we do get so much more um, than just wealth from what we build with real estate. We know that real estate is the biggest source of private assets. It dwarfs stocks, bonds, and all that, but it's more than just money. It's the built environment can provide health, innovation, community connection, culture, the center Ram keeps speaking to access. Um, and so uh, there is a need for creative thinking around this. And I sometimes sense from this committee and other legislators that it's like, okay, you want us this time, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna get creative and think outside the box. And just, I'm on some national boards of other state housing agencies. And I really wanna reassure you that in so many ways, what is happening here as the normal course of business is the thinking outside the box. In Vermont, we are doing things that other states are desperate to learn more about. I spend a good chunk of my life, my working days, answering calls from other state housing finance agencies, wondering about how did you get CRF money to pay for capital? We were told that was you know, a bright line no. And yet between the governor's administration, the legislature support, VHCB's strong network and nonprofits they support, it happened. Um, Richard was right, the homeownership program of Section 8, uh, we've won awards in Vermont because we have used that pairing of Section 8 for homeownership more than any other state. And um, there's so much that we naturally do here that already is outside the box that at some point, we, we just start looking a little illegal with our four pages of questions for the US Treasury about, I know you said rental assistance, but could I define that as, you know, something that's really um, pushing the envelope? I will put in one plug or question if you want to know like what other thoughts besides what you've already heard over email or testimony. And that would be the 200 million of rental assistance also goes to utility assistance. And as you heard yesterday, VHFA is gonna be playing hopefully a larger role in supporting the great weatherization work that OEO and all the weatherization contractors have been implementing for decades. And so I'd like to look at that utility assistance allowed for with that 200 million and find out if there's a way that that could be some kind of down payment or loan source of a weatherization loan or program. And I don't have that answer. Um, it overwhelms me to think about what that would look like, but that is something that um, we plan to look into and pursue in partnership with our congressional delegation, as well as um, traditional weatherization partners to see if we could use some of that utility assistance that can only be used this year. And is there any way we could make some strong down payments on some meaningful weatherization efforts? But again, I already talked too much. I think it'd be great to hear from others. Unless you had questions, always happy. To well, I appreciate that. And no one's gonna ever accuse you of not being creative more, don't worry. Um, the uh, weatherization, we'll, we'll wanna, I wanna talk with and get together with Senator Bray on that. I mean, I'm wondering if the weatherization grants or loans can be made so attractive that that pot of money could leverage other housing repairs for people who want that money. Uh, so I'm always interested in using these pots of money as, as carrots to bring some 
private uh, uh, sharing or contributions into the equation. Um, Commissioner so, Hanford and I have talked about that, and that's another reason to really why VHFA really supports the governor's VHIP program is that we've been talking about ways to use these two programs together because the VHIP program is modeled on taking some private equity of the landlord and, and pairing it with some public resources. And so if that program can pay for the housing rehabilitation and then the weatherization funding can um, pay for some kind of loan to support the energy efficiency. And then maybe we could bring in some of OEO's money to provide a grant if the ultimate household is eligible. Maybe I'm getting too creative, but there's different ways that we are talking about pairing these resources to be most efficient and um, leveraging them all with each other to get the most bang for the buck. Senator, right. Senator Clarkson. Um, yeah, I'd love to just tag on to Maura's thought because um, we could also, and I don't know if this is possible because I know there's such a tight uh, income, uh, there's so many tight income restraints around this, this 200 million, but we could also, as we look at weatherization, we could also look at higher, you know, uh, the, the middle crowd, middle income people who are desperate to switch out of uh, fossil fuel and in heat pumps. And I'm wondering if we can also, you know, get, you know, use it as a stimulus to really move people uh, in some substantive way uh, off of uh, what they want to get off of and, and, and help uh, finance that as we look at an all fuels efficiency model uh, and that it would be partnering with natural resources. So it's, um, I'm wondering if we can possibly do that at the same time. Yes, fuel switching is absolutely a part of the proposal that we are planning. And when I say weatherization work, it absolutely includes that. Great. Okay. Um, Jen, do you have some thoughts about what you've heard so far? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Briefly, um, appreciate the opportunity you have um, um, put in front of us to think creatively. Um, and I think it's really important for us to always be checking our assumptions about the way that we do things um, and to take a hard look at those. Um, at the same time, there's much of the work that we do that does um, work really well and has performed well over time. and I am, um, uh, want us to be able to build on that. Um, appreciate, as always, the strong support from the delegation for the federal home program. Senator Leahy is a national leader on that. Senator Sanders created and has um, continued to fight for the National Housing Trust Fund program, both of which um, are capital sources and can help us uh, you know, address the supply problem over time. And we hope that those will, will be uh, considered favorably in any you know, upcoming legislation. Um, I just want us also, if it's okay to think about the cap um, capacity, I think um, we have incredible opportunity as Josh mentioned um, with this potential funding and uh, a lot of folks that work in this realm have been working at a sprint for months and months and months. Um, so if there are ways in which we can support decisions that's going to allow them to get going faster and more efficiently. And I'm thinking about the state housing authority. It's terrific that the legislature is going to give them, um, or at least the Senate's approved another 2.8 and CRF to allow them wrap up those applications of folks that are already qualified and are just sitting waiting. And then is about to give them a signal for 10 million at least um, to get the new pr program up and going. Um, so that's going to really help their, their capacity challenge. Um, and we're really appreciative of the Senate's support for that and hope the House will do the same. So I think those are just the um, just really couple high level things um, that uh, that I'll that I'll leave for now. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Nope. I thought of one more thing. <laughs> um, mobile home parks. We um, we know that there. This committee has been very supportive of mobile home parks and infrastructure. We know there's a tremendous amount of need there. We'd love to see that in a federal infrastructure bill. We'll be thinking about it with the 20 million that the governor has proposed, if that's what others think make a lot of sense. And I'm really delighted about the governor's proposal to increase the, um, the state tax credit for the manufactured housing program. Okay. Um, Sarah, uh, we're, we're gonna be talking more about homelessness later this morning. We had some witnesses last 
week. And I'm not sure in my time that every time we wanted to have you in, either you or I have been unavailable. So I want to welcome you. I've heard wonderful things about your work. Thank you, Senator Sorokin, and thanks to the committee. I know you guys have been paying a lot of attention to this issue, and it's been a while since I've been in front of you. So, uh, you know, I'll just try and add to what my colleagues around the state have already mentioned, which I think is, you know, some really important points. Um, I think I should definitely highlight the fact that as of today, we have almost 1,900 households uh, that DCF is housing in motels around the state. And to that, another 300 plus households in emergency shelters around the state as well. So I think the numbers are, are, um, are still large. And I think that always speaks to the point that others were making around the level of housing instability that, we, we, that folks are facing. Um, we have been in conversation with Commissioner Hanford's team and the State Housing Authority. Uh, obviously, one major outstanding question is whether or not that emergency rental assistance funds will be able to be made use to help folks who are not currently in housing, right? Could we use those funds to help uh, help people exit um, motels into rental housing? And I think that's a, an outstanding question we're still trying to answer. Um, that being said, you know, of those 1,900 households in motels, um, you know, we did issue quite a bit of uh, rental assistance funds through, you know, our HUD emergency solutions grant funds and through some CRF funds paired creatively with a Vermont rental subsidy, and uh, you know more than um, uh, more than 180 households have already been leased up and exited motels into housing. Another 265 have been approved for vouchers and are actively seeking housing. And of those, mostly they're families, right? So we know of the folks in motels, about 250 are households with children. Um, and many of them have housing vouchers and are seeking housing. And so I say that just to raise up the point that one of the, the primary barriers is just the, um, the availability of housing stock across the state. And I think that point's been made, but I think when we look at, um, you know, those folks seeking housing have been doing that for, for two months, three months, four months, right? So um, it's not a small effort to find a, a unit that's available. Um, so I just want to also just lift up the, I think um, Jen was saying, the hard work of folks who've been sprinting. I think that's uh, the right statement for many months now, um, and that includes our community partners that are continuing to do the, the work on the ground to work with folks in households um, to help get them rehoused. So I think one of the key things that we are continuing to think about at DCF is how we help rehouse um, Households, what are the strategies we need at play? How are we leveraging services? How are we continuing to fund additional services? I know we're ready to partner with the State Housing Authority where it will be allowed um, to qualify folks who may be in benefits programs, right, which is one way that we can support the eligibility piece. Um, you know, I just, I, we looked at some numbers at DCF, and, I, I, and here I, I, I get outside of the work of OEO a little bit because we don't administer the benefit programs at OEO. My colleagues at Economic Services do that, but, you know, they pulled some data, and of the folks, you know, in Three Squares, Vermont, who are renter households, there's more than 7,000, right? So we know there are a lot of renter households out there who are living with, with very low income who have been, uh, their, their financial security has been negatively impacted because of COVID, and I think we're, a ready and willing partner to uh, reach out to those households and help them apply uh, for rental assistance if and when that becomes available. So I think for, for us, it's, uh, it's looking to move forward with those programs quickly, those things that we know work and we need to do. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, and then I'll just, you know, I'll mention that the governor's uh, budget proposal also included uh, a shift for a long time that we've been looking to make uh, in the next state fiscal year to um, to actually end the general assistance motel voucher program and instead shift those investments to the community. And so I know that's not the, the goal of this conversation this morning to talk about that, but I, I need to bring it to your attention. I look forward to, you know, many future conversations with you to talk about that initiative and answer questions. So I think those are the things that are coming to mind for me this morning um, as I'm listening to others as well. So. so um that shift you talked about, does that require legislative approval, as far as you know? 
Well, it, yes, it's a but it, there's a, a it's a budgetary shift. Yes, so okay. there's it's in the budget. So. Okay, could you? I should know the answer to this, but there's a lot of talk about vouchers. When you have a voucher, and you don't have a house to apply it to, or a rental unit to apply it to. Um, I, I guess the question is, is the voucher worth the entire rent or does that put a cap on what the tenant can pay based upon their income? So the, the rental assistance programs I'm referring to are sometimes called rapid rehousing or they're really temporary rental assistance programs that are intended to to bridge to a, a long-term housing choice voucher, right, or a Section 8, or to, or household exits, you know, graduates from that temporary rental assistance because they increase their income and can afford their rent. And um, how much that voucher uh, covers in terms of the rent for the household depends on the program. The two very large COVID-related rental assistance initiatives that we have are both looking at households paying 30% of their income towards rent. So, um, so it, it mirrors how the Housing Choice Voucher Program works. Um, and so uh -huh. households pay 30% of their income okay. towards housing costs. So when households have a, a voucher, um, they're tentatively approved. They go through that process, and then they start, and then they continue the search for housing, and they have a certain amount of time to to do that. Um, Sometimes the voucher will expire before they do that, and they they lose the voucher. But uh, we haven't we haven't expired any vouchers. We're still helping people seek housing, um, and uh, so the goal would be that they have that voucher. They know they have it when they're looking for housing. I guess I'm trying to get at the question, just using your classic Section Eight voucher, uh, even pre-COVID. You would take that voucher, find a find an apartment. And that would entitle the tenant to have rent be limited to 30% of their income, correct? Essentially, yes. Okay. With the new program that we established through the VSHA to pay back rent for people, did that cover that 30% for those people? Yes, but I need to defer to my colleagues at State Housing Authority who can probably answer more specifically on that. And well, on that it might be a good uh, time to go to, to Jean. I would think she could answer that. Um, but I'm just curious of whether that, I mean, we have a lot of people out there who are not on Section 8, who by virtue of our rent stabilization program from the CARES Fund, were paying no rent, my right. understanding. Right. And yet, is it possible that low-income people who had Section 8 vouchers were still required to pay rent? M Michael, Sean, I think, had his hand up with an answer. Okay. Uh, sure, and, and I'm sure Jean could answer this as well, but uh, Sean Gilpin from the Department of Housing and Community Development. The Rental Housing Stabilization Program did cover um, uh, rental obligations for people with Section 8 vouchers. So the difference between, uh, or that 30% of their income that they were, um, uh, required to pay um, despite having despite having a voucher, and it should also be noted the um, the voucher housing choice voucher uh, limits the amount of payment that a particular renter pays uh, to between thirty and actually forty percent of the rent, depending on some um, some uh, situations. Um, but it also caps the amount of rent that's allowed. So. Uh, one one can only uh, can only rent uh, rent an apartment that's being rented at the fair market um, rates that HUD uh, dictates every year, uh, with some allowances for utility payments. Um, but in short, the rental housing stabilization program covered tenant obligations um, that were holding uh, housing choice vouchers. So I guess this is a follow up question for the congressional delegation: Is there anything in the new legislation or pending that disqualifies? people who have vouchers from getting rent payments uh, through that money? I'd have to look more, this is Polly in Senator Leahy's office, I'd have to look more closely at the legislation. I think there is language in there about not um, surplanting other federal housing funds, but uh, we'll have to do more research on that. 
And yeah. that is, if I may, that's actually one of the clarifying questions that we sent to the US Treasury Department as well. Um, there's language in there about um, uh, individuals who receive federal assistance um, and it's unclear whether a housing choice voucher would be considered um, federal assistance that would disqualify them from the uh, emergency rental assistance funds. So that's something we're seeking clarity on. We may want to, I mean, I don't, if we're, we're, if we're concerned about clawback and things like that, we may want to also ask the question if we're giving rent or rebate checks to people in the state of Vermont, could that possibly disqualify somebody from help? And actually the, um, the rental housing stabilization program, we worked with tax and they currently have uh, instructions on uh, the rental rebate program that uh, funds received by the landlord from the rental housing stabilization program should not be included on line three of the LC 142, which is the landlord certificate that dictates what the rental rebate amount um, is eligible. So in, in other words, uh, without the, the jargon, um, payments received from the rental housing stabilization program are not eligible for the rental rebate. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll go to uh, Jean. Do you have some comments? And then we'll go to Angela and we'll finish um, up. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I thank the committee for being very interested in, in how this is all going to work. I'm Jean Murray. I'm from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, one of, I think the question is, can we think creatively about how ERA can be used even in its current form to do things that, that we really need to have happen here in Vermont. And there is a part of the ERA that says other expenses related to housing. And I hope that that can be interpreted to uh, allow um, people who are currently housed in our housing stock for their landlords to make repairs. I mean, one of the things that we see at Legal Aid all the time is that lots and lots of tenants are living in places that are substandard um, and that they and that there are repairs needed to the places that people are living. Um, and so that it would be good to make sure that um, our housing stock gets improved even for the folks who are already living in it. Um, another thing, um, when I think about what I want the, the money to be used for, it says it's supposed to go to tenant households um, to help them. And I think the people who already have evictions filed against them, we need to be able to have the money like we did with the last program um, available for the tenant household to negotiate an end to a current eviction case. Those are the people who are about to become homeless. And so using the funds, we, um, the rental assistance to tenant households, we need to be able to use that to end um, eviction cases. Um, and when I think about people experiencing homelessness, yes, the biggest barrier is there's not units to move into, but there are other barriers. Um, people experiencing homelessness have been housing insecure for a while. They may have other debts. Um, they, they may have bad credit. They may have um, a need for expungement. Um, they may have need for ongoing case management or at least a guarantee of some case management for the foreseeable future. And so I hope that the ERA money can be used under the part that's not defined very well about housing stability services to help those people who are experiencing homelessness get the help they need, perhaps, you know, bankruptcies or expungements or things like that, that would um, make them uh, more uh, viable tenants um, when they can find some housing. Um, the other thing that I'm really worried about is um, that people who are on the lower income levels, um, the and, and maybe this is just a generalized anxiety as opposed to an idea. People who are at lower income levels who have been housing insecure for a while, those are the people that have the hardest time 
um, getting their documents together so that they can prove that they're eligible for the programs. And so we need to be able to figure out a system that's broader than the last time. I mean, when people could um, uh, self-certify about any number of things. And of course, if they could self-certify about income and they could self-certify about their hardship and things like that, that would be the best solution. But short of being able to self-certify, if there are verification documents needed, we're all working remotely, we're all at home. This is an incredible problem for low-income people who don't necessarily have internet co connectivity, who don't necessarily have devices. And even if they do have devices, they don't have any way to reproduce a document and send it um, via the internet. So um, we need to have some of the ERA money either under housing stability services or administration um, have uh, staff um, to help people um, who are the lowest income get their documents uh, together. Um, so a question on that, it's a very good point, uh, but there were dual beneficiaries um, in terms of the past back rent program, the landlord and the tenant both uh, were helped. And I assume the landlord's a little bit more, in most cases, maybe somewhat more sophisticated than the tenant in terms of computer skills and financial skills and et cetera. Did you see in your experience that landlords were stepping up and I, and I know Michael Monty is a landlord in these cases and applied for some of this stuff. I, you know, he comes from a little different perspective, but I assume if he had a tenant that qualified, he did his darndest to make sure they applied. Uh, I wonder what you saw out there. Um, the, that question is, is better answered by Vermont State Housing Authority, but we all did, our, our group knew that um, housing providers and subsidized housing providers really did uh, reach out to their tenants and put together a list every month. The last program, if people recall, would, um, would you could apply over and over again for the rent arrears that you owed. So in other words, rent would have to be in arrears in order to be eligible for the program. So people would catch up with their rent arrears and then the next month they'd apply in the next. So um, housing providers such as Champlain Housing Trust was really good at uh, working with their tenants and, and doing applications. And, and certainly um, many landlords um, were very good with reaching out to their tenants and helping. Um, but if Angela gets a chance to talk, she'll also say that uh, um, not having um, technical ability to do things is not just limited to tenants. Uh, right. Some landlords aren't. And if you look at who landlords are in Vermont, there is a significant percentage of them that are really small landlords that only rent one or two units and, and uh, may not have um, all sorts of technical sophistication available to them. Tenants are often, I could say, we, our property managers were knocking on doors to help tenants to make sure that they got their stuff in. But let me just say that I think the notion of self-certification, no matter what program you're in, the, the ability to certify with, within a program that, you, that you're in. So if you are getting a, a voucher, if you're with a nonprofit uh, affordable housing organization, if you are getting support for any other program, that should be enough to be able to sort of say, yep, this person qualifies and then we can move them through the system probably a little faster because everybody, all the, all the, all the nonprofits and all the state organizations are constantly certifying income. Right. It, it isn't like there's a lack of that. There's a, there's plenty of that going on. So I think the question then becomes, is there certain people who are not in the system and how we could work through that? But if we could extend the certification to, to other, other, other agencies, uh, the ability to do that, that may be a way of getting to Gene's uh, notion, and I'm not, um, right. I'm outside, I'm outside my circle uh, right. here, but. Uh, That's a good segue to, to um, Angela, uh, because she uh, maybe represent people who are not nonprofits or public housing organizations, and she could talk a little bit about the application process and what we can do differently, perhaps, or what we need to look out for as we move forward into the new monies. Welcome, Angela. 
Thank you, Senator Sorokin. Thank you, everybody, for uh, this opportunity. Um, I will echo what uh, my colleagues have said about uh, avenues for this money for programs and the need to stand up a new program as quickly as possible. Um, Vermont State Housing Authority stopped taking applications on December 11th. Uh, and so that means there has been no rental assistance available um, after that time. And we are still waiting or waiting for an allocation to cover all of the applications that came in on the prior program. Um, so, the, so the longer that there is a delay in our ability to stand up a new program, the greater the hardship it is for both the landlord and the tenant. Um, and this is part of the reason why the ask has been made for even just a portion of these funds. Uh, Richard Williams uh, referred to a $50 million request to allow a new program to get up off the ground. Um, we do have a lot of challenges, I think, in terms of the type of uh, documents and certifications that are going to be required for this new program. We saw challenges on the landlord side. Um, technology and access to technology is not something that is uh, unique to the tenant population. Um, there were also many landlords who do not have access to computers, scanners, um, had to mail in their paperwork to Vermont State Housing Authority. So we need some sort of avenue or way um, for everybody to have this. The, the normally what we would tell folks is you can go to your public library, you can use the computers and the systems there. That is not available currently for many people with the COVID situation. So the normal avenue to get access to that technology is not available. Um, I think the other challenge that uh, we are going to have is this new program uh, does allow, requires a landlord and a tenant certification or application, and then a standalone tenant application if the landlord's not willing to participate. But there's not one for the converse. So as a part of the Vermont program under CRF, we had a mechanism for the landlord to apply on their own if the tenant wasn't participating or wasn't able, or in some circumstances, if the landlord had other reasons, they received less, less funding under that aspect of the program, but there was a mechanism there for them to access the funds. With the information that Richard Williams has provided, it seems as though a majority of those landlords applying into that section of the program was because they could not get tenant participation for the documents that the tenant was required to produce. Um, so that I think is a gap in this new fund or this new program. If there's a way to address that with uh, regulations or uh, guidance, that would be helpful um, because you, know, you have a landlord that's taking walking paperwork over to a tenant's door, knocking on their door, has already filled out the paperwork, asking them for a signature and they still can't get that. Um, and this is to benefit the tenant for this rental payment to keep their arrearage from piling up, to keep them housed. Um, so we would ask for some sort of mechanism along those lines that is going to allow landlords to access this money as well if the tenant is not participating. Um, I will echo about the mobile home park assistance um, and the rehab program. I think being able to use funds to rehabilitate units, get new units online that currently aren't in compliance, do repairs to existing units that need work are a benefit to everybody here. It creates safer housing, um, it creates housing stability. Um, and if you know that gets packaged with some energy efficiency work, it's sort of a win across the board um, for everybody. Uh, one final plug, one of the things that uh, hasn't been mentioned is we did uh, have a mediation program uh, that we were offering as a way for landlords and tenants to have a professional mediator paid for. Uh, this was really has really been important uh, with our eviction moratorium, uh, again, to continue that housing stability approach uh, where we're offering resources for folks to work out their differences and see if they can't reestablish the relationship um, so it will continue forward even beyond our normal eviction moratorium. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I'm going to be very brief, and uh, we have other witnesses coming in right now on homelessness. I want to thank everybody. Stay tuned. We're going to be in touch with all of you as we move forward. The legislature, I hope, will not take 
uh, a wait and see or a back seat in these discussions. We want to be an integral part of the discussion in coming up with ideas to maximize affordable housing and maximize this opportunity. Specific thanks to our congressional delegation for giving us this challenge to deal with, uh, but it's a good challenge to have. So thank you all for participating and we will be back in touch. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Those on homelessness, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Earhart right away and let him guide this discussion uh, in terms of his witnesses he would like to have um, speak to us. Earhart, thank you. you uh, Sen Go ahead. Thank you, Senator Sorotkin. Can you hear me? I can. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Senator and uh, committee members. Um, I believe, um, we have uh, Kara Casey. I, I can't see if Kara's in the room. I yes. apologize. I'm also monitoring um, the uh, House committee hearings, which you know were co-scheduled with the roundtable. Um, Kara should be up first. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask um, uh, if it's possible. Um, there was someone who had been inadvertently left off of uh, one of my witness lists. And if you um, may have a, a little bit of additional time um, for maybe two minutes of testimony from uh, Stephen Marshall, who's a uh, Chittenden County, longtime Chittenden County I, I, homeless I got, advocate. I got your email on that. And I said, I thought I responded yes. So we're all set. Oh, fantastic. If uh, maybe we could slot Stephen in um, right after uh, Emily uh, before, um, before Sue Minter and uh, Eileen Peltier. Um, that would be great. I will connect uh, Stephen with uh, the Zoom link uh, that I got from Nathan. And thanks again for your time. Thank you. Kara, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. My name is Kara Casey, and I work for the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I do housing and economic justice work there. And I am also the new co-chair of the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I wanna start off by thanking you for your hard work on allocating federal funding last year to the programs and organizations that have been able to safely shelter and house those without housing and create new housing stock and um, prevent homelessness. So uh, just for a little background on the network and the coalition to end homelessness, the Vermont Network is Vermont's federally recognized domestic and sexual violence coalition. We represent 15 independent nonprofit member organizations, which provide advocacy and support to victims of domestic and sexual violence. Um, we also have several other programs that are underneath um, the Vermont Network. And one is the DIVAS program that works within the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. That's been around for about 20 years. Uh, we also uh, platform the Deaf Vermonters Advocacy Services and the um, Statewide Sexual um, Nurse Examiners Program. Um, the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness is the planning and governing body for the HUD recognized uh, balance of state continuum of care, which applies for and receives millions of dollars of funding annually in competitive HUD homelessness funding. We support the work of local continuums of care, connect them to a broader network of stakeholders, administer federal funds, and advocate for funding and policy changes so that um, people living in Vermont have safe, stable, and affordable homes. Um, and if homelessness does occur, it's brief and rare occurrence during which everyone is treated with dignity and respect. So um, now I'll just talk to you a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on homelessness. And I understand you just had a, a housing roundtable, so I'm, I'm sure that you heard um, about that in different perspectives. But um, we have, Erhard has created a fact sheet and provided some other background materials for you all um, to take a look at on your committee's site. So at the beginning of the pandemic, our system of care was really tested. With the high risk of spreading COVID for those housed in congregate settings in the state, um, service providers, um, the state and the greater community responded quickly to move 
households experiencing homelessness into motels. The response looked slightly different in every community. Um, households were connected to food, resources, and support. Um, and this system was not without its challenges, but was extremely, extremely successful in its goal of limiting the spread of the virus among the population and ensuring that people have a place to shelter at home, even if they don't have a permanent home. So as of the first week in January, there were over 2,500 people in motels through the general assistance program. 386 of them were children. There were another 12 households in motels through the domestic and sexual violence programs. Um, so there are a number of our programs that actually um, get funding through the general assistance program and they, they pay motels directly to house survivors as kind of a, an overflow for their shelters. And then there were approximately 350 households in shelter and emergency apartments. So that's compared to um, a little over 1,100 people that were identified in 2020's point in time count. So that's last January. And uh, I will uh, point out that tonight is actually the point in time count uh, this year. And although we're not, um, we're pretty confident that most people are sheltered, we're not counting on sheltered folks this year um, due to safety issues, but uh, I think that that will be a real reflection of, of the, the change from one year to another. And it's been a really remarkable effort on parts on the part of communities to be able to um, figure out a way to get all of those folks counted this year. Um, but their response hasn't just been about getting Vermonters temporarily housed, uh, has gone further in connecting to and investing in longer term housing solutions. So there's been a monumental effort in communities to get households onto their local coordinated entry lists where they can be connected with services and prioritized for housing. Programs such as the CRF funded Rapid Resolution Housing Initiative through the Department for Children and Families have assisted households in moving out of motels. Um, the Vermont Network received these rapid resolution funds and were able to spend over $70,000 to assist 33 households that were experiencing homelessness. Um, the flexibility of these funds was really key and something that providers need more of. Uh, we were able to not only provide security deposit and rental assistance, but also things like transportation to a safer location. We had one, um, one survivor who was, going, was moving out of state to live with family um, and things like essential furniture to move into their own place. Uh, just really being able to allow survivors to access housing that works best for them. Um, about 50% of those that we supported um, just needed help getting back on their feet and then were able to pay market rate, market rate rent on their own or move in with family. And the other households were able to secure subsidies. Um, the 12 to 18 month rental subsidies that were created during this time put a much needed infusion of assistance into our system of care. As of early January, with the Vermont rental subsidy, 52 families were able to secure vouchers and 40 were leased up. And through the CARES housing project that was created, 275 host households received vouchers and 91 had been leased up. Um, so with this increase in subsidy, we're seeing, as with before the pandemic, a uh, significant challenge in finding rental units. Um, as my colleagues from one of our member organizations just spoke to in, in the House committees, um, you know, they have been working really diligently with all community partners and local landlords, but still have folks that are um, subsidy in hand, services attached, and not able to find a physical unit to move into. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what do you, is it just a supply issue or is there some discrimination going on at all that you see out there? Um, I think that it, it's definitely a supply issue in terms of not enough housing, in terms of the housing being um, outside of the fair market rent standard. Um, and then also, I mean, with such a, a tight housing market, we are seeing that, you know, it's, you know, why rent to somebody with some like really complex challenges and, and um, you know, poor rental history when you could 
to kind of have the pick of people to choose from. Uh, so we, I just heard from our um, DIVAS program that's helping women moving out of the correctional facility and just the, you know, it's really hard to be able to find a landlord that's going to rent to someone with um, a criminal background. So it's, I think it's a multitude of things, but uh, you know, they're all kind of compounded. Is there any way that you can think of that, I'm sure part of the problem is the fair market rents out there that qualify for vouchers and the rents being sky high. So a lot of the rents are above the level and therefore they're not accessible to people with vouchers. Mm -hmm. With all this money we have coming in, is there any way that we can get around that problem for from the landlord's perspective so that they could open their property up? Um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Like, I, I don't know if thinking about something like, uh, you know, being able to pay the other percentage of the rent that's kind of over um, with some programs, I'm not sure that that is eligible. Um, but I do know that in some communities, they have actually paid for a new um, uh, kind of survey and, and um, been able to say to HUD, like, hey, we've actually done our own survey. And what you say is kind of fair market rent in this area is actually way too low. Um, and here's what the actual, you know, rental market looks like. I think that the barrier to doing that is that it costs, um, it costs money. Yeah, I just uh, probably um, missing some key factors, but it seems like if we have a pot of money to do rehab of buildings, we have a pot of money to do weatherization of buildings, we have a pot of money to pay people's rent, it, a lot of those things are going to help landlords immeasurably. Why can't we ask something of the landlord to, in terms of opening up more units to low-income folks? Um, so, something yeah, about. yeah, I definitely think that a lot of the projects that VHCB has done in collaboration with communities um, have had that. Um, have had certain standards, you know, that those units need to meet in terms of meeting fair market rent. So, um, you know, that's something that's, that I think our housing partners are skilled at doing, um, at creating that housing that does meet that fair market rent um, and also has, you know, units set aside for folks that are experiencing homelessness. I mean, it, it's another way of saying, I mean, when we do all our economic development programs, we give money out to corporations and things like that. We ask something in return that they provide good paying jobs or higher wages than they might otherwise pay. So this is sort of, we're putting an infusion of money into housing. Um, anyhow, enough said about that. We're gonna have to start moving on. We have about four more witnesses and we only have like 15 minutes. Senator Clarkson. Yeah, I mean, it just, it was a question I had with our last group um, of our round table, which is we didn't really talk about supportive services. And I think landlords would be um, far, uh, it just strikes me that if we could partner, I mean, most of these people moving out of homelessness into housing have a support service somewhere attached to them. And um, if we could guarantee that with every person moving out of homelessness into a, into a housing unit, I would hope that that landlords would be um, much more, you know, more open to uh, to enabling this transition uh, into permanent housing for people. Uh, and I don't know how much that's discussed as an asset. That's a huge asset for for both the landlord and for the incoming tenant to have that uh, support service working with them to hopefully ensure the success of this transition. Yeah, I think that certainly helps a landlord to know like, hey, this person has had challenges in the past, but they actually have somebody there supporting them. And there's also been a, a, an investment in landlord liaisons, which are folks that are really, um, that are working at those same organizations, but they are actually the person that reaches out to the landlords and supports the landlords as well. Right. 
So I think that's a great, um, that's a great model too. I, I have one question if I can, and then maybe we can move on to other witnesses. Do you, you're not associated with um, a direct provider like a CAP agency or OEO, you're a freestanding advocacy group, correct? Um, the Coalition and Homelessness or the Vermont Network, sorry. The Vermont Network, I guess. Um, we're, yes, we're a freestanding. Um, oh, and the co I don't know, the coalition as well. I guess, I'm, do you have an opinion on this pending transition to local agencies of the motel program? We don't have an official opinion. What I will tell you is that um, our members, because uh, we have 15 member organizations, that our, our member organizations, some of them were actually the first to transition from um, the you know, ESD holding the money to actually the, the member organizations holding the money. So many of our domestic violence um, and sexual violence organizations actually get funding from GA to, um, to house people in motels. So they kind of cut out that middleman. And um, I think the key that those folks will tell you is that um, there really needs to also be an investment in the staff time and the administrative time to be able to do that work. Okay. Um, anything else, Kara would like to move on to other witnesses if I could? Um, yeah, well, I just, uh, you know, thank you so much for all your work and, um, and the continued investment in those, those three legs of the stool, services, subsidy, and housing infrastructure. And I just wanted to also urge you to support um, the governor's recommendation to use the, um, to use 20 million in one-time funds um, and 34.8 million overall to VHCB to help to address some of those critical needs that we were talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Is there an order? Uh, I see we have three more, three or maybe more, if we include Sue, uh, uh, of witnesses. Do you have you guys have an order that you prefer to go? Senator, if I could interrupt quickly. No. Yes, um, Emily uh, was next, I believe. And then uh, Stephen and um, Sue and Eileen. Okay. Sorry. Emily, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Taylor, and I'm currently a service coordinator at Champlain Housing Trust out of Burlington. Um, thank you for your time today and for the opportunity to testify to the amazing work that Champlain Housing Trust and agencies all around the state have been doing. This is actually my third year attending Vermont Homelessness Awareness Day, but my first year testifying. Uh, the previous two years I attended as a housing advocate when I worked for Chittenden Community Action. I started with Champlain Housing Trust in March of last year, just two weeks before Governor Scott issued the stay home, stay safe order. And immediately after, Champlain Housing Trust worked with the state of Vermont and community partners to transform the Harbor Place Hotel in Shelburne into a COVID-19 isolation and recovery housing site for those who did not have a home to stay safe in and for those who would struggle to isolate at home due to living with immunocompromised persons. My role very quickly shifted into providing short-term service coordination for guests staying in the COVID-19 motel uh, to help them connect with coordinated entry, to apply for three squares, and begin working on a temporary housing plan for after their quarantine period ended. We served 102 households through the end of September at Harbor Place. And then in October, CARES Act funding allowed us to purchase the Ho-Hum Motel in South Burlington for this purpose, which is still operational today. To date, we have served 169 households at the Ho-Hum. So that's 271 unduplicated households served between the two COVID sites in 10 months. Harbor Place has since reverted to its original model, a motel serving GA emergency housing guests. In addition to purchasing the Ho-Hum, um, Champlain Housing Trust also purchased Handy's Extended Stay Suites in Colchester with coronavirus relief funds made available through the CARES Act. This hotel converted into office and shelter space for up to 21 households for steps to end domestic violence who as of last month have fully moved in. Uh, Steps reported a 50% increase in domestic violence cases due to the pandemic. 
And finally, yet importantly, Champlain Housing Trust also purchased the Baymont Inn in Essex Junction with CARES Act funding to convert the building into 68 permanent apartments. The building was renamed Susan's Place, aptly named after Susan Ainsworth Daniels. Susan was a longtime social worker at Champlain Housing Trust for over 25 years and began the development of our resident services department until her passing last March. All of these projects, uh, but Susan's Place especially, have been a major demonstration of the extraordinary partnership Champlain Housing Trust maintains with the Chittenden Continuum of Care and Coordinated Entry System. I'm sure that you've been hearing about these partnerships from all around the state today. All 68 households who moved into Susan's Place moved in from literal homelessness and through vouchers made available from both the Burlington and Vermont State Housing Authorities, as well as many Vermont rental subsidy vouchers and care support from the state of Vermont, we were able to ensure affordable housing to some of the most vulnerable Vermonters in our community. I'm now the site-based service coordinator for Susan's Place and I'm offering support to all 68 households here. I'm actually still in the process of moving into my office out here. Um, and I'm now offering support to a gentleman, John, who experienced chronic homelessness before moving into Susan's Place. He was housed in Vermont over five years ago, but was evicted after his apartment sustained significant property damage inflicted by guests that he was frequently inviting over. And unfortunately, in this case, they were not coming over for dinner and charades, but because they knew that they had a place in the community where they could go to abuse heroin and substances alike. John grew up in an extremely abusive household, and over time, he thought that he learned that saying yes to other people and letting people do what they wanted to do was how to build lasting relationships and make other people happy. But not long after meeting these people did he become addicted himself, suddenly paying rent, keeping the utilities on, and respecting his neighbors weren't much of a priority. John declined services from agencies who reached out wanting to help him. And ultimately it wasn't until he was evicted that he understood the gravity of the lifestyle he had been living. Though today he would tell you that he wasn't really living for himself. The last five years were a constant uphill battle for him to meet his basic needs every day and work towards stable housing again. He entered into a lengthy rehabilitation program and still goes to the Chittenden Clinic to maintain his sobriety. He had very large debts to pay to his previous landlord and housing subsidy provider, which is a barrier to housing that we see in many cases. Um, but thankfully for John, he was able to finish those payments last year due to the Rapid Resolution Housing Initiative Fund, which was made available from the CARES Act as well. Over time, he began saying no to toxic people in his life and has maintained connections with his support team, which now includes me. And every few days here at Susan's place, I'll see him come into the lobby and just sit so he can say hi to his neighbors who are coming home. Susan's place has been a really bittersweet project for me personally. Um, I couldn't be happier to see so many people in permanent housing, but yet it's heartbreaking to know that they couldn't access affordable permanent housing until Susan's place opened in November, which was almost a full eight months since I last worked with some of them as their housing advocate. Helping these 68 households find housing in just two or three months is really so certainly something to celebrate and we have celebrated, um, but there is still so much work to be done for the hundreds if not thousands of other Vermonters that are still experiencing homelessness and temporarily living in hotels all across the state. I couldn't help notice yesterday that uh, Governor Scott proposed a one-time appropriation for affordable housing development on top of the normal allocation. So as I conclude my testimony for you today, I will just leave you with this, that Champlain Housing Trust is absolutely ready to create or build more affordable housing just as soon as we can. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh... Okay, I'm going to move on to Steve Marshall. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Stephen Marshall. I've been an advocate and an activist for homeless community here in Burlington for at least five years. And in that time, I've mostly 
circulated with the folks who are living outdoors. So I rise to speak for them. I'm really grateful for and admire the testimony that has come today, House testimony and Senate testimony about housing, about services to homeless folks. But the group that is unspoken for, who I stand to speak for, are those who lose their permission to live anywhere. When you lose your housing, you move to a car, you move to a tent, uh, you might move into an ATM. There are the, the situations when you lose your housing are, can be very desperate. And what, I, what I'm at, uh, here to ask you to do is to consider a plan that I call safe parking, safe camping. Most folks in this phase, they don't have permission to live anywhere. So the proposal is to require towns have a plan so that when someone loses their housing, there's a plan to help them do something. Um, one story that I heard was from a guy who was sleeping in his car and the cop would come and knock on the window and say, you can't sleep here. So if you're homeless and you're living in your car, you have to be, you're constantly being shuttled along. I lived in my vehicle for a long time. It was really hard to find some place I could safely park. So the idea is to bring everyone who is between housing within the law by having a law that helps them find a way to be safe. That proposal is on the, uh, the, e the ECH, is it VIAC or VCH? Um, now I'm forgetting uh, the, uh, the Google Drive, the folder, and I probably could find it. But anyway, it's in the folder with the other documents prepared for today. And it's called Safe Camping, Safe Parking, and I hope you'll take a look at it. It's probably for somebody in the legislative committee a little immature, but I think you'll see that I've covered a lot of the details. Thank you very much for the chance to speak. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Sue, would you like to talk to us? I do. Are you, can you hear me okay? You're loud and clear. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for having us here today. Um, I'm here. Uh, I think you met me last week, um, and you know that I'm the executive director of Capstone Community Action. Uh, the anti-poverty organization in Washington, Lamoille and Orange counties and part of a network of community action agencies around the state. But today I am here really as a member of the Washington County Homeless Response Team, which really the state brought together in the immediate onset of COVID, but has become an ongoing task force uh, a meeting and working collectively ever since. And you know, we've really worked as a collective force ever since the first days of the shutdown. And we have together stood up critical supports for our homeless neighbors in our county. And I am really pleased to really be uh, testifying together with Downstreet's uh, tremendous asset director, uh, Eileen Pelcher, who has also worked with me as what we call the Unified Commanders. Uh, really early on, we set up the Washington County uh, Incident Command Center. Um, and she also continues and we meet weekly and she's really a key leader of our task force. So we will be submitting written testimony and just speak briefly today, uh, sharing our insights, our experience, the data uh, and how we've worked through this crisis, but also where we go from here. Um, I wanna just thank you all so much for taking the time um, like you are today to really reflect and listen and advocate for solutions for homelessness and housing insecurity. We know that homeless, being homeless is deeply traumatic. It's stigmatizing and can really result in long-term negative impacts on people's physical, mental and financial health. And, just want to say thank you for taking on this responsibility forward today uh, and throughout your session. 
Um, you know, we just came from the House and heard quite an extensive te testimony from around the state. And really, the point is that every region of our state has responded to the pandemic in different ways. But what's so critical to understand is we have all been stepping up really tires tirelessly to meet extraordinary and unfolding demands of our time. And I want to emphasize that we've worked very closely with our state agencies, and I want to shout out and commend tremendous dedication of work from the Agency of Human Services, particularly uh, DCF, Children's and Families, the Office of Economic Opportunity, as well as the Departments of Health and Mental Health, and also the Emergency Operations Center. All of these agencies and entities have been dedicated partners. Um, and we feel thrilled, uh, especially by the state's proactive agreement to actually place homeless neighbors into hotels. That's a huge leap. Um, they eventually took over the feeding of the hotel guests that many organizations like Capstone were doing uh, actually for five months. Um, and they have also been very much supporting the team with resources. So housing counseling, helping moving people out of housing insecurity, mental health, medical supports, safety and security at the hotels, which has become quite acute. Um, but I also wanna recognize the key programs that you have funded through CARES Act. These have been essential from the housing subsidy vouchers you were talking about, the rental assistance and rental rehab for our landlords. Uh, we have a rapid resolution funding, which is really essential because it's flexible in how it's used and the eligibility for these funds. Um, and all of these collective resources have made really the difference in our community. And we are hugely optimistic and hopeful uh, that these resources will continue to be available at least for six months, but we need, believe we need them much longer. Um, I wanna ask Nathan if he can put a slide up. We have prepared an impact report, um, which uh, really tries to um, lay out what we've done, but also to emphasize that while we've done a tremendous amount, we continue to face dire numbers that you will see here. Um, I want to say uh, at the outset that the bottom really shows you, I think, if you can see the whole thing, um, the point is that a home is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. And as you look at all of the services and we lay them out in the second page of this report, I encourage you to really see the numbers of things we've done. It really shows you how much it takes to serve this community. Um, up the upper left here, you will see the, um, the graph that really looks at the numbers and the change, the dramatic escalation of the numbers of people in our hotel based on our coordinated entry report. Before in early March, uh, we had in Washington County 128 households, now 324 households, 153% increase. That represents 396 adults and 91 children. So many children that are homeless and we serve many of them through our Head Start program. On the positive side, we've actually managed to house permanently 65 of these households. That's a huge uh, accomplishment, but not nearly enough. And just as critical, we've created 67 new units. Um, incredible advance, but again, uh, not meeting the need. Uh, paralleling this, we have uh, our wonderful shelter. And I do want to recognize at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see all of the members of our task force. You're almost there. One a little bit further down, can you see? Um, which includes Another Way. It includes the Agency of Human Services. Uh, the Good Samaritan Haven, um, the uh, Parent Child Center uh, of Washington County, and it includes our Good Samaritan Haven and the um, Washington County Mental Health Services. So all of us work together. Our shelter, before the pandemic, we had 76 bed capacity. Now we have 25 bed capacity. So this 51 bed decrease is not going to simply uh, come back after COVID. And on top of that, these are only shelter um, beds for individuals, no families. And we already heard 91 children. So we have a tremendous challenge. 
Um, I think that these numbers can feel overwhelming, um, but we really feel that also this year has taught us that we're stronger than we think, <laughs> we're more capable than we believe, and we are even more resilient than we ever imagined. But I feel it is so important to remember that we can do amazing things and we have to use this crisis as a transformational time to go forward and not back to where we had been. So with that, I'm gonna hand the screen to Eileen um, to give you more of where we go from here. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Sue. Eileen, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Nathan. You can uh, take the slide down now if you'd like. Thank you. I'm Eileen Peltier, Executive Director of Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on Homeless Awareness Day. My role today is to share some specifics about what we, the Washington County Homeless Task Force, together believe is needed. Sorry, I usually do the verbose inspirational speech, but not today. Today, we need action. So here we go. First, I will touch on the three-legged stool of housing supply, subsidy, and case management. Supply in Washington County is tenuous and totally inadequate. I don't overuse the word crisis, especially these days, but I do think it is time to think of our housing supply challenge as a crisis. Capital funding is critical. For our region, we can immediately use capital funding to support development like our upcoming project in Berlin that will serve 30 families, as well as the many pipeline projects waiting to queue up for funding. We can use capital to bring more offline privately owned rentals back online, which would mean a continuation of the rental rehab program that was so successful in the past year. We believe there is a strong potential to successfully house individuals in a single room occupancy peer-based model. Washington County Mental Health Services has leased four buildings and is currently housing a total of 14 individuals with great success. We would use capital to expand on this model. Yesterday's news that the governor's budget includes an overall 34.8 million to Vermont Housing and Conservation Board is very welcome. We hope you all will support the governor's recommendation, which will truly begin to address the housing supply crisis. The second leg of the stool is subsidy. We need more and we need it to be committed to projects early. Housing supply and subsidy are codependent. With the Biden administration signaling they will be increasing voucher availability and the governor's increased capital proposal, there is some reason for hope. Case management is the final leg of the stool. To be clear, case management directly impacts housing retention which is the household's ability to stay permanently housed. This is no small issue in Vermont. For some of our neighbors, an apartment is a temporary respite between episodes of homelessness. Permanent housing is a misnomer for too many Vermonters. Our task force is working hard to understand the many and varied ways in which we case manage our vulnerable neighbors. There are many successful programs and a strong group of providers, but we can do more. We need the flexibility, to use our funds in innovative ways, and we need more funds to meet the growing need for case management. Speaking to the emergency shelter beds for individuals, as Sue said, we've lost 51 beds due to COVID restrictions. In the near term, we need to develop 40 to 50 new beds. To make this happen, we need both capital to develop the building and a commitment to ongoing operating support through the Agency of Human Services. For families, we believe expanding family supportive housing vouchers and associated programs is critical. This program combines vouchers and case management and it works. The Family Center of Washington County has increased case management in the hotels, but more is needed both immediately and as part of a long-term solution for families. If we can address the supply issue, putting families directly into permanent housing through the family supportive housing program is a far better option than hotel stays. With funds, we can do more for the 91 children in our hotels today. To ensure we coordinate effectively and efficiently, we need financial support to invest in the development of a virtual hub for homeless services in central Vermont. Our task force has built a sense of purpose and partnership, and we would embrace the opportunity to develop a virtual hub 
that provides cohesive, coordinated programs for people experiencing homeless across Washington County. We are committed to our partnership and strongly believe we can have a greater impact if we can get capacity support to move our vision along. Many of these requests can move, can have an immediate impact. Others will take time, time we may not have. At this point, we understand that the hotel system, including the enhanced case management, will end sometime in 2021. We want to say clearly that we believe this would create not only a short-term disaster, but would critically reduce the long-term success of the programs I've just highlighted. Continuing to invest in the hotels while simultaneously funding the innovative solutions identified is the only humane option. This is not to suggest that we don't have problems at the hotels with so many people congregating, but we are working on that through a joint approach of security and supports with other community partners. Certainly, it is a costly solution, but we have the opportunity in this moment to permanently reinvent our system so that the likelihood of homelessness will be greatly reduced and the quality of life for our neighbors will be greatly improved. Before I close, I do want to speak briefly to the AHS's proposal to transfer the GA, the General Assistance Hotel Funds to each county. Although we understand there's much more to discuss about this proposed program, we want to say at this time, our task force has very serious concerns and we do not support the proposal. We will be pleased to testify more specifically on this in the future. In closing, I want to thank the committee for your time today, your dedication to helping our most vulnerable Vermonters and your support over many years. We certainly can say these are challenging times, they are. But for too many Vermonters, every day is a struggle that begins and ends with a worry about whether or not they will be able to rest with a roof over their head and a warm bed. Too often, we stigmatize individuals and families experiencing homelessness. We believe that focusing on housing our neighbors as a systemic challenge is a moral imperative for Vermont. Moving the conversation from homeless to unhoused neighbors speaks to the need to address the system as a whole. With that, we stand ready to continue our work and to do more and more and more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. It's about noon and the vigil is about to get started. Uh, committee members, if you want to join that, you can do it on YouTube or you can connect with Nathan or Earhart and they can let you into the room. I want to thank everybody. It's been a long morning and great presentations and incredible amount to think about. So I bid you adieu uh, until, uh, I guess, this afternoon at one.